Fractured Soul, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book One, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Part Three, The Hunters. Chapter Twenty Eight. He's cute. Maybe you should look into that program. Gala pointed to a photo of a sharply dressed young man giving a PowerPoint presentation in a glossy brochure. I had several others just like it laying out across a countertop in the kitchen of her and Dom's new apartment. Each represented a different academic program at NYU. I was still stumped about which major I would declare, and the first day of school was just a week away. Unfortunately, none of those glossy photos were calling my name. He's a professor, I said, reading the caption below the image, of chemical and biomolecular engineering. Hard pass. I could see you working as a chemical engineer, Dom piped in as she poured a glass of water. I bet you'd ace that program. Of course I would. I have a photographic memory. I can ace any program. But that doesn't mean I want to. And you're so humble, too. Gala said with a laugh. I shrugged. It's not bragging if it's true. Dom slid a bowl full of grapes in my direction, and I popped one into my mouth. Watching my friends do the same, I suddenly understood how the ancient Greeks mistook the Olympians for gods and goddesses. They looked awfully magical, even in a New York City apartment. That's exactly why you should hard pass on NYU altogether and come to Columbia with us instead. I can't, I sighed. I told you, I'm not Columbia material. You're exactly Columbia material. Probably half of the student population is made up of keepers. It's nowhere near half, Dom interrupted. Well, a lot, anyway, Gala conceded. Plus, you already got accepted. And I declined it. The paperwork. It's a simple fix, Gala said with a wave of her hand. At least let us show you around before you decide for sure. I promise you will love it when you see it through our eyes. If it will get you to stop pestering me about it, then fine. I will let you show me around. But don't get your hopes up. I've been dreaming of attending NYU for forever. It's iconic. More iconic than Columbia? They're both very iconic girls. Dom gave us a matronly smile. Gala and I weren't really fighting, of course. We both just had strong opinions. But Dom wasn't a fan of conflict, even in jest. You're right, Mama Dom. Gala smiled warmly at her friend and turned back to me. So when do we get to give you the grand tour? Not today, I glanced at my watch. I told Millie I'd head down to the shop and help her out. Maybe tomorrow afternoon? Perfect, Gala's face lit up. I can't wait. I grabbed my purse, checked to make sure the clay tablet was tucked safely inside, and headed for the door. It was probably silly to carry the artifact around with me everywhere, but I couldn't bear to leave it behind. It was too valuable to me. And I still didn't know the extent of its powers, just that it had a lot. If it ended up in the wrong hands, it could mean bad news for me, and maybe for my mom, too, wherever she was. By the way, Dom said on my way out the door, Sean's coming over for pizza tonight. You should swing by, too, after work. Sounds great. I'll see you guys later. Speaking of Sean... He leaned against the wall just outside of the entrance to their apartment building, waiting to escort me to Millie's shop. Morning, I smiled. He grunted in return, slowly leaning forward off the side of the building. I grimaced. Do you need some coffee? No. He stormed off ahead of me down the sidewalk. Why the sour mood, then? I'm not sour. I'm fine. Huh. I scuttled ahead, trying to keep up with him. I didn't like having him as a bodyguard any more than he liked tagging along with me everywhere, but he'd never been quite so grumpy about it before. You know, you don't have to do this. Do what? Follow me around everywhere? I won't say a word to Millie or your mom. 
They'd find out anyway. If they want me to act as your guard, then that's my assignment, official or not. But I don't mind it anyway. Could have fooled me, I mumbled under my breath. Look, I'm just not very excited about going into your aunt's shop this morning. Why not? Abby's back in today. Ooh, Abby. I remembered how he got all extra concerned at the mention of her before we left town for the Hamptons. But before I could ask him any more about it, we'd reached my aunt's shop. Technically, it was a pharmacy, and like many pharmacies, it had a little gift shop attached. But that was where its normalcy ended. The sign outside simply read, Apothecary. That's it. No branding of any kind. It was painted in white letters on a black sign, looking like it may have come straight out of the early 1900s. Maybe it had. Walking through the doors was like stepping into another world. Bundles of dried flowers and herbs hung sporadically from the ceiling. Giant antique wood tables sat in the middle of the room, one full of beauty products, complete with an ornate round mirror in a sterling silver frame, and the other full of bath and body products surrounding an enormous copper wash basin built into the center of the old table. The walls were lined with ten-foot-tall wooden cabinets, trimmed with great detail, arching frames, etched glass-fronted cabinet doors, and shelves on shelves on shelves. Glass bottles in various shapes and sizes held a multitude of pills and poultices and herbal concoctions. One shelf was designated for my aunt's natural tea blends. Millie and a petite brunette girl stood in black aprons behind an old-fashioned soda fountain-style counter, though the actual soda fountain had been long removed. Behind them, a set of thick, velvety, emerald green drapes hung from the ceiling to the floor, separating the front of the store from the private employee's area in the back of the shop. It was a lot to take in, this strange mix of witchy wonders and hippie remedies and 1950s aesthetic all blended into one high-end Manhattan pharmacy. But it was quintessentially Millie. Good morning, Millie beamed from the opposite side of the counter. Come in, come in. I want you to meet Abby. The girl bashfully smiled and extended her hand. I couldn't help but notice Sean's cheeks grow pink as he met her eyes. Hi, Abby. I'm Everly. I've heard a lot about you. It's nice to put a face with a name. She shook my hand, then looked behind me. Hi, Sean. I haven't seen you around in a while. Abby's cheeks grew red as well, and she nervously began fidgeting with the hem of her apron. Yes, well... Millie stacked up the paper she'd been examining and set them to the side. Where should we begin? The door chimed as a customer entered behind us. I pulled Sean to the side so I could watch my aunt and Abby in action. I'd spent enough time down at the feed store back home to understand customer service, but I didn't know the slightest thing about the potions and salves and herbal remedies surrounding us now. I was content to sit back and see how they handled it. Good morning, sir. Is there something we can help you find today? The man was probably an inch or two shy of six feet, with walnut-colored hair and hazel eyes. He didn't fit any of the standard descriptions of keepers, but then again, Agarthians could look however they wanted. I leaned into Sean. What is he? Sean whispered back. I don't sense any powers. He's just a human. Does Millie serve humans? Of course, Sean chuckled. Okay. Well, the stuff in these bottles must have been approved by mortal laws, then. I browsed the labels, wondering how she ever got away with selling things like dragon's blood, and if the words beneath the label, Dracaena Draco, were code for the dragon's region, or if it might actually be a nickname for some kind of herb. I hoped the latter, otherwise Millie had a lot more explaining to do. 
She flitted around the edges of the shop, helping the man find all the items from his surprisingly long shopping list, and I don't think I'd ever seen anyone look as happy as he did by the end of it. He tossed in a stick of black licorice at the counter as he was checking out, and left with a smile as wide as the Brooklyn Bridge. Wow, Millie, you really made his day. Healing is a beautiful thing. Many of my customers have been burned by traditional medicine and doctors, so they turn to me for more natural solutions to their problems. That's so cool that you're able to help, she sighed. I wish I could help everyone. How's your father doing today, Abby? Abby raised a shoulder. About the same, I guess. I just don't know what to do anymore. One minute, he's totally high on life, full of energy and excited about the future. And when he crashes, he crashes hard, lower each time. I honestly wasn't sure if he was going to make it through the weekend. Millie frowned. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Are you sure that he's not using anything illicit? Abby's eyes grew wide. No, no, of course not. My dad is a lot of things, but he's not a drug user, especially not now. He's so wrapped up in this new business plan of his that he would die before he'd jeopardize things with drugs. He doesn't even drink wine with dinner anymore. Hmm... Millie looked unconvinced. Well, I keep meaning to swing by and check on him. We've just been so busy here. Go now, Sean said. I can watch the shop while you're gone. Are you sure? Yeah, I've done it loads of times before. I can handle it for an hour. Take Everly. I'm sure she'd love to meet Mr. Mason, and maybe you could teach her a thing or two about your business while you walk. Does that sound like something you'd like to do? Millie asked me. Sure, I shrugged. Sean looked pretty eager to get us out of there. I suspected it had something to do with Abby. I looked at the girl. Is that okay with you? Yes, absolutely. Millie is like a miracle worker. I would love to bring you guys over to see my dad. He could really use your help. Chapter 29 Abby continued to elaborate on her father's symptoms as we walked. Millie's electric blue heels gave us a steady cadence as we walked the six blocks to Abby's apartment. Do you remember when exactly all of this began? Millie asked. Abby thought for a moment. I want to say it was right around the 4th of July. We usually drive out to see my cousins and shoot fireworks, but he wasn't feeling well that day. It may have been before that, but that's the first instance I specifically remember. I see. And did anything else in his life change around that time? Maybe a new diet or a different gym? A new hobby? No. Dad has been decidedly antisocial since my great-aunt Linda passed away in the spring— I think her finances were a mess, so he's been working with her attorneys to get everything sorted out, when he's feeling up to it, that is. I see. Well, should we give him a call before we go up? No, I'll go in first to make sure he's not asleep or anything. He'll be happy to see you. Abby stepped up to the door, tucked under a green awning, and we followed her inside and across a quaint lobby toward the elevator. The building was clean and quiet, with an attendant ready to accept packages and greet guests. Abby's apartment was on the fourth floor. After giving her a minute to ensure her father was awake, we followed her inside. The apartment was small but tidy, with charming herringbone wood floors and tall ceilings. The windows looked out to the building next door, but they let in enough light to offer a cheery vibe to the living area. To one side were doors to two bedrooms separated by a single bathroom. The other side held a kitchen and a small eat-in dining area. A middle-aged woman with dark hair and deep-set frown lines stood in the kitchen, unloading the dishwasher. Abby's father lay under a blanket on the couch, and he set his copy of the Wall Street Journal on the coffee table as we entered. 
Millie Gordon. He smiled, but it didn't quite reach his eyes, which were bloodshot and framed by dark circles. Mitch Mason, she smiled back. It's been too long. Oh, no, don't stand. There's no need to be formal with me. She sat beside Abby's father on the couch. You look like you're feeling better today. Spry as a kitten, he laughed. If this was good for him, I hated to think how he looked at his worst. The woman in the kitchen hummed a song that sounded almost like a lullaby as she closed the dishwasher and dried her hands on a tea towel. I turned to Abby, who had been shooting me curious glances since we entered, and raised a brow, jerking my chin toward the kitchen. She responded by silently mouthing, Housekeeper. It felt rude to stand around and listen in on Millie and Mitch's conversation. Can I have a tour? I asked Abby. She looked embarrassed. There's not much to see. Compared to where I'm from, everything in New York is worth seeing. Abby nodded and gave me a quick walk through the place. Her room was narrow, with a twin-sized bed pushed up against one wall, its pink comforter well-loved and probably used since she was a little girl. A full-length mirror stood propped up in the corner, with pictures of Abby and her friends tucked in around the frame. The bathroom held a pedestal sink and a small rolling cart with a hair dryer hanging out of the drawer. And her father's room wasn't much larger than hers, but the apartment had character and a homey feel that I couldn't help but find endearing. Back in the living room, we saw the housekeeper standing at the opposite end of the couch from Millie. All finished, Mr. Mason, and I left that information you requested on the counter. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, thank you, Nikki. I'll see you tomorrow. The woman nodded and ducked out of the room, giving Millie a wide berth as she passed. Abby and I moved toward the kitchen, grabbing seats at the two-person cafe table sitting just off to the side. I figured we could just let them talk in peace, she said. For a bit, I agreed. But Millie could go on all day, so feel free to kick us out if you think your dad needs some more rest. Abby grinned and looked down to the table, picking at some spot only she could see. It struck me that she already knew that about my aunt. She probably knew Millie better than I did. I'm sure he'll be okay, I said, not really certain at all. But if there was anyone who could get to the bottom of what was causing Mitch's illness, it was Millie. He was in good hands. Abby's smile faded, and she pressed her lips together. Her expression had changed when she looked back up at me. So, I hear you're going to Columbia. Ha, huh, you heard wrong. Did Millie tell you that? She nodded. She would like for me to go to Columbia, but I'm enrolled at NYU. Oh, nice. What are you studying? Good question. I don't know yet. What about you? Where are you going? She looked back to the table. I'm actually taking the year off to care for my dad. Millie was gracious enough to offer me full-time employment at the shop. Oh, I didn't know what else to say to that. All right, girls, Millie entered then, her usual cheerful demeanor snapping me out of the uncomfortable silence that had just passed between Abby and me. I've got to get back to the shop. Abby, why don't you take the day off? With Everly and Sean both working today, I'll have all the help I need. Abby started to protest, but Millie raised a hand and kept going. I won't take no for an answer. Consider it a paid holiday. Abby's cheeks flushed as she gave a reluctant nod. Thank you. But you, Millie pointed to me, are not so lucky. Come on now, you've got a lot to learn about the pharmaceutical sciences. I stood, taking note of the bright blue and yellow folders on the kitchen counter as I left. A large, amateur-looking logo was attached to the front reading D&N Investments, the opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you for the tour, Abby. You've got a lovely apartment. I shot one more glance at the folders. 
Why would Mr. Mason be seeking investment advice from the housekeeper? Uh, it wasn't any of my business. I'm sure I'll see you around at the shop again soon, and it was nice to meet you, Mr. Mason. Come again, he called out as we exited. Millie seemed on edge as soon as we got to the other side of the door. She moved quickly ahead, squeezing into the elevator next to an older woman with a giant handbag containing a gray-faced chihuahua. I waited until we were back on the sidewalk, safely inside a crowd of people surrounded by street noise, before I finally asked, So, were you able to figure out what's wrong? Millie frowned. Dark magic. I've got to phone it in to the council immediately. Chapter 30 Hold on, dark magic? Millie furrowed her brows. Shh, keep your voice down. We'll talk back at the shop. My mind was blown. I spent the rest of our walk back to the apothecary, shrewdly examining every person we passed on the streets. I had to look at the entire world differently. A blonde in leather pants caught my attention. Was she mortal or a keeper? A Garthian or Olympian, good or evil? Dark magic. The words kept ringing in my mind. Was there dark magic at play in my mother's disappearance? Surely Millie would have mentioned it at the time if she'd suspected anything. It seemed like the kind of thing that should have been brought up sooner rather than later. She brushed through the door of her shop and dashed straight past Sean through the velvet curtain into the back of the building. Sean stopped what he was doing, looking from me to the curtain and back again. Did I miss something? His features darkened and his muscles tensed. Is it Abby? Did something happen? What's wrong? Abby's fine. Or at least I thought she was fine. Was dark magic contagious? I shook the thought from my mind. Millie's making a call to the council. She thinks she knows what's wrong with Mr. Mason. Well, Sean leaned against a bar stool in front of the old soda fountain counter. Are you going to tell me what it is? Dark magic? I sounded so unsure of myself, and by the look on Sean's face, he wasn't sure if he should believe it either. He shook his head. That doesn't make any sense. What kind of dark magic? I have no idea. I was kind of hoping you might tell me what it is. I mean, aside from the obvious connotation. What does that look like among you all? Sean frowned. Keepers don't practice dark magic. Then who? Millie shoved her way back through the curtain, wearing her black apron and smoothing the front of it nervously. She took a deep breath. Okay, now where did we leave off? I suppose you should learn how to run a transaction first. Then we can cover the basic section of the store. Uh-uh, nope. She's talking about dark magic. What did you see, Millie? My aunt shot me a dirty look, then turned to Sean. You know I can't get into the details. It's against protocol. There may be some dark magic at play, but it has been reported, and the council will take care of things from here. But how is he? Sean pressed. How's Abby? Do I need to go over there? Millie sighed. Abby is fine. Mr. Mason will be fine, too. We just need to let the council do its job, and everything will work out. She dropped her chin and lowered her voice. And I think you know it's best for you to stay away from there. Sean groaned and began pacing, running a hand through his auburn hair. I can't just sit here when I know they could be in danger. They're not in danger, Sean. She touched his arm, stilling him again as she continued. You need to stay here. I spoke with your father, and he agreed to give it high priority. Sean was still scowling, but he didn't argue. Some quiet understanding passed between the two of them before Millie finally turned back to face me. Come to the back with me. I'm sure you have some questions. Sean can manage the front a little longer while we chat. She shot a look in his direction that let him know the conversation was finished. Well, that was one way to prevent him from leaving. 
He wouldn't make eye contact with me as I passed him on my way to the back with Millie. There was definitely more to this story. Hopefully, I could get some details from my aunt. At first glance, the area behind the curtain resembled any other employee storeroom. More glass bottles lined the walls here, and a table with two chairs sat in the middle of the room. Three lockers were built into the back wall for purses and other personal items. But upon closer examination, it was clear that this was no ordinary break room. A bookshelf was packed to the rim with ancient-looking tomes. Tattered spines boasted titles such as Bloodletting, Materia Medica, and Brewing with Belladonna. In the corner sat a four-foot-tall copper still that steadily dripped oil into a curved glass bottle. Millie pulled out one of the chairs at the table and motioned for me to sit down while she scanned the bookshelf. It is unlikely that you will take on powers like mine, but unfortunately healing is all I know. Ah, there it is. She pulled an especially thick textbook off of the shelf and blew dust from the top of its pages, then laid it on the table in front of me with a thud. So while I can't teach you to diagnose illnesses at a glance, or identify and erase certain sources of pain like I have the ability to do, I can give you some basics on herbal remedies. Wolfsbane, mandrake, and liverwort. I slid my fingers across a title as I read the words aloud. 101 Effective Remedies from the Middle Ages. I'm going to guess this wasn't one of your textbooks from college. Millie laughed. No, it wasn't. But the great thing about healing is that anyone can do it to some extent. You just need the right ingredients and a little know-how. So even if... Even if healing is not your power, you'll at least have some understanding of our ancient knowledge as you enter the world as an adult. What she'd wanted to say was that it would be helpful even if I never got any powers of my own, but neither of us wanted to discuss that now, or ever. It wasn't exactly a favorite topic of mine. Thank you. I will definitely have a look. It's not very light reading, but I think you may find some parts interesting, and it's useful nonetheless. I appreciate it, but what I'd really like to know is more about the dark magic you mentioned. I know you said you can't get into the details. I understand. But Sean said keepers can't practice dark magic. So who, then, is making Mr. Mason ill? Millie steepled her fingers and her lips tensed, pursed and relaxed, opened and closed. But I wasn't in any hurry. I knew from one too many cop dramas on TV that I should let the quiet continue until it was uncomfortable. She'd talk eventually. And she did, after a minute or two of awkward silence. It's complicated. That's not a real answer. Who practices dark magic? Mortals? Or are there other supernaturals I haven't learned about yet? Neither. It's... It's the fractured. Oh. That's why she didn't want to say anything. She still thought I might be defective. Well, surely not all the fractured turn to dark magic, right? Is there like some secret coven or something? They're not witches, Everly. Well, I take that back. They're not all witches. But by definition, any exertion of supernatural powers done outside of the Council's knowledge is classified as dark magic, and the fractured are not governed by the Council. Who are they governed by? Millie frowned. No one. The fractured are supposed to be eradicated and their souls preserved, that's what the hunters are for. But if one slips through the cracks and they happen to exert a supernatural power, they're automatically assumed to be practicing dark magic? Even if said exertion is just, like conjuring up some chocolate chip cookies or butterflies or something? First of all, there is no power that allows for conjuring up cookies. And secondly, the power of a fractured soul is unpredictable at best, and often fatal. They can't control it, and with occasional surges that are beyond their natural abilities, 
it's not uncommon for a fractured soul to inadvertently kill themselves and every mortal around them. So you kill them instead? I crossed my arms in front of me. I am a healer. I don't kill anyone. But the hunters, the Agarthians, they specialize in extracting fractured souls. They save them. Sounds like murder to me. I told you it's complicated, but without the pureness of a keeper's soul, the powers will usually sour. Like spoiled milk? It's not a great analogy, I know, but I'm not sure how else to explain it. I'll cut to the chase. Even if a fractured soul learns to wield its powers appropriately, the fact that the soul is incomplete is reason enough to remove them from the population. They turn, Everly. There is no goodness in a fractured soul, only greed and envy and pleasure derived from the pain of others. Fractured souls become evil. She was pale, but she'd done it. She'd finally admitted the truth about me. It was why I was being guarded. She thought I might sour. It was why she was unconcerned about my mother, and it was exactly why I needed to get her back. My mother wouldn't do this to me. She just wouldn't. But without any powers to prove myself otherwise, I needed her to tell them the truth. Millie might have thought my mother ran away from her problems when she became pregnant with me, and she probably thought my mother had done it again by disappearing this time, too. But I knew better. My mother didn't run away when things got hard. She was too careful, too caring, too full of love to risk having a fractured child. She wouldn't do that to the world, and she wouldn't do that to me. My mother was still out there somewhere, and I was going to find her. Chapter 31 Millie, Sean's voice called out from the other side of the curtain. We've got a visitor. She didn't get up right away, but instead stared at me for a long moment, as though she wanted to say more. But I was finished. I didn't care to hear Millie's theories on how I would soon turn evil and kill people with my broken powers and my fractured soul. I refused to believe it. Millie? His voice was closer this time. She stood abruptly. Read the book, she said, tapping the dusty cover on the table. When you're done, I have many more you can look through. And Everly. The tension broke in her expression, and I saw the aunt I knew and loved, wrought with concern. Hang in there. We don't know what the future holds. She rushed out then, away from the unspoken words, the future we didn't want to face. I followed her and felt the tingle across my skin before I made it to the other side of the curtain, and sure enough, as soon as a velvety green fabric brushed past my arms, I saw him grinning at the counter. Tate. I nodded and moved ahead, avoiding eye contact and pretending not to notice the way he made me light-headed. I was uncertain if my reaction was one of fear or excitement. Everly? His voice was warm, and despite my best efforts, it drew my attention right back to his beautiful face. Meet my friend, Osborne. And then I noticed his equally dangerous-looking, golden-eyed friend. I don't know if I was still recovering from the conversation I'd just had with Millie, or if the sight of Tate had me a little off kilter, but something about the look of his friend Osborne took my breath away. Not in a love-at-first-sight, he's-so-dreamy kind of way, but in an, oh, my stars, I think he wants me dead kind of way. I was terrified. I grabbed the edge of the counter, trying not to panic, as I scanned the shelves for a paper bag to breathe into. I was losing it, and everyone was watching me spiral. Are you okay? Sean whispered. He turned his body so that he was blocking my view of the others. I nodded, but it still took me a few seconds before I could think clearly enough again to speak. I was vaguely aware of Millie's voice behind him, describing Mr. Mason's symptoms. They weren't here for me. Hunters, I whispered to Sean. He nodded. Yeah, 
They were sent by the council. They're here to investigate the dark magic Millie reported. She just called like 20 minutes ago. Keepers act quickly. I peeked around the side of Sean's head and locked eyes with Osborne. It was brief, but it was enough to feel like I got the wind knocked out of me again. I felt like I was going to be sick. I need some air. Sean looked over his shoulder. Hey, Millie, you good here? A look of irritation flittered across her petite features. Sean had interrupted her. Yeah, sure. She waved him off and got back to the conversation. Sean untied his apron and tossed it on the counter. Let's go. I couldn't argue with that. I grabbed the giant textbook Millie had given me and followed Sean out of the shop, careful to keep him between me and Osborne. I turned around to get one more quick glance as we slipped through the front door, but Osborne was engaged with Millie, listening intently to her recount of the afternoon. It was Tate who watched us leave, his expression indiscernible. I smoothed the hairs on my arms and turned my back on them, anxious to get out into the open air. Are you sure you're okay? Sean asked once we were out on the sidewalk. I think so. It's just the hunters. Something in my subconscious knows they're after me, I think. It's instant fight or flight syndrome when I see them, you know? And that buzzy tingle they give me? I shuddered. I just don't like it. Buzzy tingle? Sean looked perplexed. Yeah, that feeling of being hunted. Hmm. Sean twisted his mouth to one side. I'm not familiar. I've never felt any kind of buzzy tingle. Then again, I've never been hunted. Interesting. So the feeling was definitely not associated with my powers coming in. I hadn't wanted to admit it out loud, but I sort of hoped it was the beginning of my transition, like maybe my body was saying, Nope, can't hunt me. See? Powers. So this hunter, Osborne, he was sent by the council to investigate the dark magic Millie reported? Yep. This is one area where the different races work together. No matter who reports the dark magic, an Agarthian hunter is assigned to the case. Did Millie, uh, give you any specifics on how dark magic works? Yes. She told me it's done by fractured souls. Right. Sean shrugged, uncomfortable and uncertain of what to say. I guess my tense shoulders were a dead giveaway that I didn't like this topic very much. And you're positive that Osborne is only here for the case Millie reported? He can't hunt anyone else? I don't think so. That's not how it works. One hunter per soul. Otherwise, things get messy. I didn't want to ask what messy looked like. So why is Tate with him, then? If only Osborne can hunt the suspect performing the magic on Mr. Mason, Tate shouldn't have anything to do with it. Thaddeus is assigned to you. Like I said, things can get messy when multiple hunters are involved. He'll have to accompany Osborne in this case to ensure lines aren't being crossed. That wasn't all. I knew there had to be more to it. The pained expression on Sean's face was enough for me to know he wasn't telling me everything he knew. Suddenly, I understood. I stopped on the sidewalk and narrowed my eyes at Sean. You know I have nothing to do with this, right? He grimaced. Of course I know that. But the Agarthians? Well, they don't leave anything to chance. Thaddeus has to tag along with Osborne, just in case they narrow the suspect down to you. In that case, the job will be handed back to Thaddeus. No wonder Osborne was looking at me like that. I was a suspect in his case. I shivered again, recalling the feeling I got from Osborne's death stare, and continued walking. There just aren't many fractured souls around here. They're usually caught early on, Sean muttered. He wasn't helping. But there was another question bouncing around deep in the recesses of my mind as well. A loophole of sorts, and one that would make me appear even more guilty if anyone found out. Millie mentioned that any powers or magic practiced outside of the council's knowledge were considered dark. 
but I also happen to remember that hunters could only hunt fractured souls. So what happened if a mortal soul practiced magic? Was it even possible? The weight of Millie's book under my arm was suddenly much heavier. If I could learn to heal, would it be possible for me to learn other spells as well? Because if there were some sort of tracking spell or truth serum or anything I could use to find my mom, I wouldn't hesitate to do it. The question was whether these things were real or if my imagination was simply getting away from me. I'd read about too many other imaginary witches and wizards growing up. But this wasn't fiction. This was real life, real power. I could only hope that using it wouldn't be enough cause for Tate to pull the proverbial trigger. Chapter 32 Thanks again for getting me out of there. We paused in front of my aunt's doorstep. Her giant mastiffs whined on the other side, impatient for the attention they knew I'd give them when I came in. You got it, Sean replied. Are you going to meet up at Gala and Dom's place later? We're ordering pizza. Yeah, that's what they said. It sounds fun. Cool. I'll meet you here around six and we can walk over. I said goodbye and pulled open Millie's front door, bracing myself for impact from the oversized canines inside. Hey, Lemon Drop, Tiny, you enormous lovable goofball. I scratched their heads and pushed my way further into the foyer. I'm home, I called out toward the kitchen. I didn't know if Jeeves was home, but if so, I knew he'd be in there chatting it up with Millie's chef. Hey, Ev. He popped his head around the corner a moment later. Pierre just made lunch. Want me to fix you a plate? No, thanks. I held up a textbook my aunt gave me. I'm going to go upstairs and get in some reading. Millie wants me to study up so I can help her at the shop. All right, he said in his thick Alabama drawl. Holler if you get hungry. I bounced up two flights of stairs to Millie's study on the third floor. Gorgeous bay windows overlooked the street below, and Millie's desk sat in the center of the room on a plush, fuzzy, cream-colored rug. The shelves were full of eccentric tchotchkes, scattered among more ancient-looking books like the one under my arm. I pulled out the desk chair and laid my textbook down, but I wanted to explore a bit before I sat to read it. Once I'd wrapped my brain around the idea of looking for magic, I couldn't shake it. I had about four hours before Millie would return from the apothecary. Surely I'd be able to find something useful before then. I ran my finger along the spines of the books lining the walls. There must have been hundreds, maybe thousands, and they didn't appear to be organized in any sort of recognizable fashion. If only she had some kind of digital card catalog, or better yet, an encyclopedia of magic where I could search by topic— First things first, I needed to know if it was possible for mortals to practice magic, because as of now, I was still a mortal. But there was nothing magical about any of the books in Millie's office. This was where she kept her actual textbooks from school. The older books were a mix of biographies and medieval history books. One shelf dedicated to Greek mythology looked promising— but upon closer inspection, the titles all seemed to be mainstream books published in the last twenty years or so. Modern display copies of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were about the most interesting things on the shelves. She also seemed to have a slight addiction to dime store romances, but hunky Scotsmen weren't going to help my current situation. Of course, she wouldn't keep books about magic hidden out in the open here. Jeeves, Pierre, and her little housemaid had no idea what Millie really was. Even Abby didn't know, and she worked around all the strange objects at the apothecary every day. They probably all assumed my aunt was just into some quirky kind of witchcraft or something. I considered calling it quits and heading back downstairs to eat lunch, but my stomach was still a little unsettled from the morning's events. So I plopped myself down into Millie's office chair and stared at the book. I swiveled the chair back and forth, looking at the title until my vision doubled. I didn't want to read about herbs. I wanted my mom back. 
With my head thrown back, I spun the chair in a full circle, watching the light fixture twirl overhead. My foot pushed against the fluffy carpet, spinning me harder and faster until the room blurred around me. A man cleared his voice from the doorway. <clears throat> I stopped the chair, wobbling slightly, as I waited for my dizziness to dissipate and my vision to clear. But Jeeves's massive form was hard to mistake for anyone else. Looks like you've really got your nose in the books in here. He laughed and brought a platter to the desk. It was a tiny charcuterie board, decked out with cured meats and fruits and cheeses with names I couldn't pronounce. I thought I'd bring you a study snack. Ah, oh, thanks, Jeeves. Don't thank me. It was all Pierre. I'd have brought you some Vienna sausages and Kraft singles, but he's got better taste than that. What you reading, or not reading? I slid the book in front of him. One hundred and one effective remedies from the Middle Ages. Sounds fascinating, he winked. Anyhow, I'll let you get back to it. Come on down if you need a break. We're doing a self-clean cycle on the oven this afternoon. He waggled his brows and stole a small block of cheese from my plate. I think I'll stick to my reading here, thanks. Suit yourself. He grinned and ducked back out of the office, leaving me along with my thoughts and a very expensive snack board. Before long, the board was half empty, and I still hadn't opened the book. I rubbed my eyes with the heels of my hands and groaned. There was no use wasting time. If I wasn't going to read it, then I may as well make myself useful and head over to Gala and Dom's apartment. Maybe I could help them set up for games and dinner. With a textbook under one arm and the board balanced in my other hand, I snuck back down the stairs, put the half-eaten platter on a table in the foyer, and slipped out of the front door before the dogs could hear me tiptoeing around. If Jeeves and Pierre heard me leave without Sean there to guard me, I'd be in big trouble. But the girls' apartment was only a short walk away, and I was a grown woman. I didn't need a babysitter. Life in Manhattan carried on as normal around me, People crowded the streets, talking on phones or blocking everyone out with earbuds. A mother ran past with a jogging stroller, headed for Central Park. That was a good idea. It would be safer to cut through the park toward my friend's apartment. That way, if Millie happened to leave work early, she wouldn't see me. I trotted along after her, inhaling the fresher air of the trees once I turned the corner into the park. Maybe one of the girls would know a thing or two about mortals performing magic. Could I trust them to keep it a secret, though? And did I dare risk them? If I didn't involve them, I could still plead ignorance if I got caught. After all, no one had given me any specific rules regarding magic. I'd only learned of it today. But if I got Gala and Dom involved, we could all be punished. The thought sent a shiver down my spine. I felt like I was in trouble already, and I hadn't even decided to do anything yet. It was probably my conscience talking, but it could just shut up with all that negativity. I glanced around, worried suddenly that some passerby may actually be telepathic like Dom. I felt exposed. Then I saw the eyes, gold and glowing, like some nocturnal animal in the shadows, waiting for its prey, and I realized I was exposed. But these weren't animal eyes. They were human. No, not human either. A Garthian. Osborne stepped out of the shadows of a large tree and crossed his arms. I didn't get my buzzy tingle of a warning that I was being hunted, which made it all the more unsettling. I liked the warning. After a quick scan of the horizon, I realized he was alone. Tate wasn't with him but I didn't know if that left me feeling better or more concerned for my safety. At least Tate was a known enemy. I knew what to expect and I could handle him. Osborne was a wild card. He watched me pass him by, staring blatantly. I gripped the book tighter under my arm and picked up my pace. I wasn't interested in hanging out alone in a park with a known hunter. He didn't follow me, thankfully. Instead, he just stood in the center of the sidewalk, his eyes on my back, until I finally disappeared around a curve. 
Out of his sight, I broke out into a dead sprint. If he wanted to stop me, he would have. I had no doubt about that. But it didn't seem to be the case. He just wanted to intimidate me, let me know he was watching. Jerk. I was gasping for air by the time I reached Gala and Dom's place. My sweaty palms gripped the textbook under one arm and my bag with the tablet on the other. I gave them two knocks before opening the door and quickly closing it again behind me. I didn't want to risk Osborne following me here. He wasn't welcome. Everly, hey, you look like a hot mess. Gayla jerked her head up from her cozy spot on the couch. A fashion magazine sprawled out across her tan legs. I am a hot mess. A quick scan of the living room showed no signs of Dom. It was a good thing, because I had no idea what kind of craziness she might pick up in my mind right now. My thoughts were spinning out of control. Hey, I started to ask Gayla about magic, but seeing her happy, innocent, dark eyes smiling back at me, I just couldn't do it. I didn't want to get my new friends in trouble. Switching gears, I continued. Millie gave me some reading materials to study up on for my work at her shop. Do you mind if I hang out here and look through it? I can't focus back at her place. Of course. Gayla sprang up from the couch. She wasn't the most observant person, which was ironic, considering how she was supposedly a seer. But I was grateful in that moment. I didn't want to explain what just happened or why I was all out of breath. You know we've already got a bedroom for you all set up. It was true. They'd insisted on getting a three-bedroom apartment, even knowing that I was going to NYU. Gayla seemed so sure that I'd change my mind and join them at Columbia. Like I said, not super observant. But her intentions were kind. She decked the room out with comfortable furnishings and a neat little white desk propped against the wall near the window. I placed my book on the desk's glossy surface and stared out onto the street below. My little white owl friend sat perched on a wrought iron railing of a second-story balcony across the street. From here, it almost looked like he was watching me through the window with those wise old eyes of his. I gave him a nod and immediately felt silly for it. But at this point, we were practically besties. He was always there. And somehow, he helped to calm my nerves. At long last, I sank into the office chair and flipped open the book. It was time to learn a thing or two about natural herbal remedies. Chapter 33 Millie's book was surprisingly full of fascinating facts. It might just come in useful one day, after all. Like, if I ever came across some verbena, I could fix gingivitis and anxiety, or I could make a man impotent for six days. And if I ever got a hold of henbane, I could deprive a witch of her powers or mix it with menstrual blood to create a love potion. Okay, so maybe the information was more entertaining than actually useful, but it had me captivated. Time flew by as I flipped through the pages, committing each page to memory. In any case, I'd be ready to help Millie at the shop, no matter what a customer may need. About three quarters of the way through the book, I'd finished learning about the different herbs and their qualities, and stumbled into a section on elixirs. Millie's elegant penmanship looped its way across a tattered yellow piece of parchment singed on one edge. The page was tucked into the fold of the book, and it looked like it may have been a hundred years old. It said, Incantation for Elixirs. Delacquio venantium et os ad viteios et consumate. My breath quickened. This was it. Magic. I'd found a spell. It had to be. But could it work for mortals? There was only one way to find out. An introduction to the chapter described folklore and gave a strong disclaimer that most, if not all, of the following elixirs are unproven to work. Ha, huh, yeah, right. Millie wouldn't give me a book full of useless information. I bet they'd all work just fine with the addition of that incantation. I began flipping through the pages of elixirs that followed, looking for one that I could practice. Knock, knock, knock. Someone pounded at my door. 
Suddenly feeling guilty, I slammed the book shut at exactly the same time Sean burst into the room. Everly Gordon, you are in big trouble. I raised my brows. I probably was in trouble, but I wasn't about to let Sean talk to me that way. Excuse me? You left, and you didn't tell anyone you were leaving. Millie was in a full panic when she got home from work. Jeeves never saw you leave, so she called me right away. And what did you tell her? I told her we were here. Then I ran straight over and prayed I wasn't lying. Lucky for you, I'm here then. I don't think it's funny. His jaw clenched. I know you don't like having me around, but if I fail at this simple job, there's no way my father is going to allow me to graduate to bigger missions. Please, Everly, don't run off. For my sake, if not your own. My smirk melted away. I'm sorry, really. I didn't think about it affecting you. I just wanted to get out. Tate's little hunter friend had me all shook up earlier. Tate's got a friend? I turned to see Gala grinning from the doorway. Trust me, I said. It's no one you want to know. I shuddered. Gala shrugged. You're probably right. Those hunters are usually too arrogant for my taste. Isn't that the truth? Are you ready to take a break? Dom will be back any minute with the pizza. I noticed the daylight fading through the window. I'd been cooped up in here reading for way longer than I'd realized, and yet I was just getting to the good stuff. My gaze lingered on the book for another moment. I didn't want to stop now. Come on, school hasn't even started yet, and you've already got your nose buried in books. Live a little. She tugged on my arm, and I reluctantly fell into place behind her, following her into the living room. A couple of decks of cards were set out on the small dining table, and music was playing from a speaker in the corner. Dom entered just moments later, carrying two of the biggest pizza boxes I'd ever seen. The next couple of hours almost helped me forget the drama from the morning. Sean was way too competitive for his teammate, Gala, during our game of spades, though I couldn't blame him for getting grumpy. I had a literal mind reader for my partner. We wiped the table with him. Otherwise, it was a normal, enjoyable evening. But I never could quite clear the thoughts nagging at the back of my brain. Dom studied me once or twice, trying to figure out what was bothering me, but I don't think she was ever successful. I made it a point to keep those thoughts pushed down while I focused on cards and how the others all ate their pizza in a weird New York way, folded up like a taco. I tried to act normal. I was doing a good job at it, too, until they started talking about school. Most of my classes are first thing in the morning. That way I have the whole day free to do anything I please, Dom grinned proudly. She was definitely the most responsible one in the room. Ah, uh, I had to schedule early classes, too. Rasa wants me at his studio every day after lunch for my training sessions, Gala groaned. I don't know why they're making me go to school at all. We all know where I'm going to end up. Oh, sorry, Ev. She frowned in my direction. I really needed to work on not getting so upset at the mention of Rossell. I dragged Gala and Dom back to the gallery as soon as we got back into the city the day after Gala's big party on the yacht, but it had changed. The portrait of me that once hung on the wall inside was now replaced with an oil-painted scene of a lavender field in France. The windows were all fixed, and the metal sign out front was replaced with a whitewashed wooden one that said Rosalina and Jude. "'I swear it said Rossell,' I had exclaimed." Tell them, Sean, you saw it too. I believe you, Dom had said. But it didn't matter. Rossell denied everything when Gala pressed him on it. I asked her not to push too hard, given his warning at our last encounter. Stay away from Gala. He sure wouldn't be happy to know that she had set up an entire bedroom for me in her apartment. Then again, I honestly couldn't care less about what Rossell thought of me. I knew he wouldn't hurt Gala, and with Sean at my side and Tate in my shadow at all times, I didn't think he'd be able to do anything to me, either. I guess that was one good thing about being stalked by a hunter. "'It's fine,' I said to Gala. 
We'll get to the bottom of it, whether Rossell decides to help us or not. Even if that meant I'd have to play with magic to find my mom. Dom quirked a brow at me, and I quickly changed the subject back to their classes. What about you, Sean? Are you going to be busy in the mornings, too? Well, I was kind of hoping you'd get your schedule figured out soon, so I could set mine. I'm supposed to stay with you on campus, remember? Right. I felt a pang of guilt again. Poor Sean. This couldn't be any easier on him than it was on me. He'd basically be attending both NYU and Columbia, between his schedule and mine. Since I haven't picked my classes yet, maybe you can help me decide, I smiled, trying to make him feel a little better about it. Would you rather me take morning classes or afternoon? I guess it doesn't matter much, he shrugged, as long as the evenings are clear. Why do you need your evenings clear? Gayla asked. Are you getting a human job somewhere? No, I just told Abby I'd be around if she needed anything. Gayla's shoulders slumped, and Dom pressed her lips together. Things always got awkward around here when Abby entered the chat. Oh, was all Gayla could say. Sean ran a hand through his hair, and his green eyes glistened as he spoke of her. Things have just been really weird since her dad got sick. They got this giant inheritance from his aunt, and then he fell into his deathbed, almost like it was the wealth that made him sick. Every day I wonder if it'll be his last, and it's really hard on Abby. Well, at least she'll be rich if he dies. Jealousy wasn't a good look for Gayla. Dom cringed, but Sean didn't seem to notice. His head was in the clouds. I normally am not a fan of the hunters, but in this case I'm cheering them on. No one should be practicing magic. That kind of power belongs to keepers and keepers alone. I gulped. Someone out there has enchanted the cash. That's what I think anyway. It's probably how his Aunt Linda died, too. But I refuse to let it get to Abby. He banged his fist on the table, causing the rest of us to jump in our seats. Sean was livid, understandably, and I was sick with guilt. Dark magic was taking the lives of people he really cared about. Was that something I should meddle with? Dom glanced at me again, curiosity evident in her dark eyes. I stood abruptly. Well, it's getting late. I should probably get to bed. It's only 10.30, Gayla said. Yeah, I should have taken my vitamins half an hour ago. Sean, do you mind walking me home? Sure, he muttered. I retreated back to my room and grabbed the book before giving a hasty goodbye and bolting out the door as quickly as I could. My mind was racing with thoughts of magic and murder. I knew the risks, and yet it was so tempting. If I could find the right elixir, maybe something to force the truth out of someone, I could get Russell to talk and find my mom. That kind of magic wasn't really dark, was it? Chapter 34 Abby returned to work the next day, slightly ragged and obviously exhausted. The situation with her dad really seemed to be taking a toll on her. She pulled her unwashed hair back into a messy bun on top of her head and slumped forward onto the countertop. Sean hovered around her like a helicopter mom, fussing over every sigh and stumble she made. He was concerned the dark magic was getting to her, too. It wasn't, though. Abby was down, but she wasn't sick. She was dealing with grief. I knew the look well. It was the same look my mother used to get, a distant emptiness in her eyes, a hollow expression, an empty well of tears, whenever I asked about my father. Abby was slowly coming to grips with the fact that her father was probably going to die. I didn't blame her for losing hope. I know that sounds harsh, but in a way, it seemed that if she could process some of her grief while he was still here, maybe it wouldn't be so bad when he finally did pass. My mother lost a piece of herself when my dad left, and that hole of despair haunted her throughout my entire childhood. Maybe if she'd seen it coming, like Abby could see the loss coming with her dad, it wouldn't have lingered. But no, my dad was a deadbeat who blindsided her by leaving when she needed him most. Sean, come here. I tossed him a rag and a bottle of furniture polish. Abby tended the counter while Millie rearranged supplies and overstock in the back room. 
I had been dusting shelves and straightening bottles, trying to learn where everything was in case I needed to fill in for Abby soon. But she needed a break from Sean. I would if I were her anyway. With a pained expression, he finally pulled his eyes away from the poor girl and joined me near the front of the store. You've got to let her breathe. I know, he shook his head. I just don't want to miss anything, you know? If this fractured loser decides to go after Abby, too, I want to spot the signs right away. Maybe if we catch it early, we can help her. She's going to be fine. She's just dealing with some stuff right now. The door chimed, and a familiar face entered the shop. It was the same customer with a long grocery list of items from the day before. Back so soon? I asked. Sean nudged me in the ribs and took over. Welcome back to the apothecary, sir. Is there anything we can help you find? He smiled, the same wide grin I'd noticed the day before. This guy sure was cheerful. I just need to grab a few items. I think I know where they are. Great, Sean smiled back. Let me know if you need any assistance. His smile faded quickly as he turned back to me. I pointed to a dusty spot he missed and moved to the next section of shelves. Abby still leaned vacantly against the counter while the customer browsed some shelves on the other side of the store. He cast a glance over his shoulder and, upon meeting my eyes, flashed that broad smile again. Why are you so taken with Abby anyway? You know you can't be with a mortal. Shh, Sean quieted me with a glare. I know, he whispered, but that doesn't mean I can't care for her well-being. I think you care for more than just her well-being. I raised my brows. What about Gala? Do you, uh, care for her well-being, too? Sean snorted. I did once, when we were younger, but time changes people. He shook his head. It wouldn't matter anyway. I can't be with an Olympian any more than I can be with a mortal. What? This was news to me. Why not? Our souls, Everly. It's like we explained that night at your aunt's house. We have soulmates, always within our own race. It's the only way our kind can survive. New souls are not simply created out of thin air. If we don't mate and have pure children, there aren't vessels for the old Atlantean souls to enter and return to the earth. But one keeper is as good as another, right? It's not like the souls would be fractured. Sean let out an exasperated sigh. It can't happen. It's just a fact of life. There's a curse. If any two keepers from different races seal a bond, if you catch my drift, they die. So you're telling me if you so much as hook up with Gala, you'll both die? Like get struck down by lightning or what? He shrugged. Possibly. The curse doesn't specify how you'll die only that you will. Sometimes you just quit breathing. Sometimes nature intervenes and does a job for you, or sometimes you're driven to insanity and take your own life, like Romeo and Juliet. I hate it when people romanticize death. She was Atlantean. He was a Garthian. I laughed. You're kidding, right? They knew better. Their families tried to warn them, but they didn't listen. So the fates did what had to be done. And Shakespeare just happened to be around, taking notes of everything? I think he saw it in a vision, like all his other plays. He was Olympian, you know. Brilliant mind, that one. Huh. If what Sean said was true, then the keeper way of life was sounding less and less appealing. And I felt bad for poor Gala. She was obviously smitten with Sean, but she could never have him just like how she had no say in her job or where she went to school. She might be loaded to the gills with cash, but as they say, money can't buy happiness. In her case, it seemed like a fact. Mr. Smiley cleared his throat at the counter, trying to get Abby's attention. She'd been staring off into nothing, but turned abruptly at the sound. He didn't seem upset at all, though. He simply grinned. Did you find everything you were looking for? she asked just about. Is the shop owner here today? Abby nodded. I think she's still here, somewhere in the back. Want me to get her for you? The man shook his head. Oh, no, not if she's busy. 
He smiled again. It was getting old. No one was that happy. Something seemed off about this guy. I set down my rag and moved to join them at the counter. Oh! The man put a finger in the air like he just had a brilliant idea. I almost forgot. I do need a little monkshood. Monkshood? Why was that ringing alarm bells? My mind flashed back to the page I'd read in Millie's book. I remembered the big red letters that said, Toxic. Monkshood, also known as aconite, was a well-known poison. Sure, Abby said, reaching for a key to the locked cabinet behind the counter. The man cut his eyes over to the curtain and back to Abby. He looked impatient. What are you using the monkshood for? I asked. I tried to keep my tone light, but he clearly heard the accusation I implied. His smile faltered as he turned and raised his chin. Lotion. My girlfriend has fibromyalgia, and the only thing we've been able to find to help her with nerve pain is this lotion we make from the powder. Hmm. In small controlled doses, I knew it could help with neuralgia. That's what I got from overloading on information. My mom used to joke that I would binge on one topic until I thought I was an expert. But with medicine, most everything was okay in moderation. His story checked out, and I needed to stop jumping to worst-case scenarios. Even if he did seem a little suspicious with his two happy grins and anxious glances at the curtain. Abby measured out the amount he requested and totaled up his purchase for the day. He tossed in another black licorice stick for good measure and placed his messenger bag on the counter to retrieve his wallet. When he unclasped the bag, I noticed a bright blue and yellow folder sitting inside. An amateurish logo flashed through my memories. D&N Investments, the opportunity of a lifetime. What did you say your name was? I asked. David. He grinned and accepted the receipt from Abby. Thanks again. With one more furtive glance toward the back room, he casually waved over his shoulder as he hurried out of the shop. Do you know that guy? I set my gaze on Abby as the door swung shut behind him. Just from the shop, why? I think he may be friends with your housekeeper. I doubt it, she said. Nikki just moved here last month, and she's terrified of street crime. I don't think she gets out much. Sean raised his brows at me, but I shook him off. Maybe I was jumping to conclusions again. I didn't know if it was the same folder in Mr. Smiley's bag or not, but I would definitely do some investment research later, just to ease my suspicions. Chapter 35 Gayla and Dom were waiting for me near the Columbia Gates on 116th after lunch. I approached them, warily eyeing the Greek-looking statue that stood to the right of the entrance. "'Hey, girl!' Gayla grinned as I approached, then followed my gaze to the statue. The towering stone woman wore long robes and held a book open in front of her, showing the world pages that I couldn't quite make out. I shielded the sun from my eyes and squinted to get a better look. "'It's Latin,' Dom said. "'What does it mean?' Gayla shrugged. Probably nothing, but who cares? I'd rather check out the hottie across the street. I followed her to the statue on the opposite side of the gates. A similarly dressed man stood in robes that hung open to expose an attractively chiseled chest. He does have rock-hard abs, I said with a snort. Gayla giggled. Come on, there are way more interesting things to see inside. I followed the girls through the gates and immediately felt like I was leaving New York City and stepping onto the set of a movie. It was a quintessential college experience, and as devoted to NYU as I was, I couldn't help the flutter of excitement I felt as we made our way down the tree-lined path into campus. I'd been reluctant to accept the girls' offer for a tour of Columbia, but since we were here, I figured I'd make the best of it. So I truly listened as Dom gabbed on about the history of the campus and its ties to the keepers, and Gayla was sure to point out all the best study spots, coffee shops, and where to find the hottest guys. Over there is where the lacrosse team hangs out, she said with a mischievous glint in her eyes. 
In other words, that's probably where you'll find Gala most afternoons, Dom laughed. I can't help it if the sun's rays are brighter on the low steps. I've got to get my vitamin D somehow, she winked. Speaking of the low library, Dom gestured ahead. Do you know the story behind Alma Mater? She's the mother of knowledge, right? We all turned to admire the giant statue standing guard at the front of a very Grecian-looking library. Sort of. So Columbia was actually called King's College when it was founded by the Olympians shortly after coming to America. It was an Olympian college? Yes and no. They never intended for it to be exclusive, but King Barius thought it would be useful to educate the keepers on our history. Mortals were admitted as well, though for different subjects, and eventually the name was changed to Columbia to be less auspicious. But he commissioned the statue of Alma Mater to sit here on the steps as a reminder to us all that the university is rooted in keeper history. I stepped closer to the intricate statue, admiring the details and taking in the woman's beautiful face. See the crown of laurels on her head? It represents fame or notoriety, influence. It's a nod to the Agarthians. The lamps on the arms of her chair represent wisdom and teaching, a nod to the Olympians. And the scepter is made of four heads of wheat, one for each keeper race and one for the humans, but it's topped by a crown. The crown is a symbol of all keepers, a reminder that we are to work together to rule over the mortals and keep balance on the earth. What about the Atlanteans? I asked. Do they get a nod as well? Gala laughed. Alma Mater herself is Atlantean, the keeper of the people. Do you see how she welcomes the human students in with open arms? Atlanteans have always been closest to the humans. They lived and worked alongside them until Atlantis was sunk. But even now, you'll find them walking the face of the earth more than the other keepers. Hang on. I put my hands on my hips and turned to face the girls. Where are the other keepers if not walking the face of the earth? Olympus is known as a city in the sky, and Agartha is at the core of the earth. Now it was my turn to laugh. Gala giggled too, but I had a feeling she was laughing at me, not with me. Dom frowned. You don't believe me? I mean, I believe in science, and unless Tate lives in the molten rock core of the earth and city in the sky is a poetic way of saying the Olympians live on mountains or something, I shrugged. It's not possible. You'd be surprised at what's really possible. I looked at the statue again. This world, this history they spoke of, was almost too much to take in at times. The bronze woman's expression seemed to echo my thoughts. She was graceful and strong, the epitome of truth and knowledge. And yet it almost looked as though the weight of it all, the secrets behind her wise eyes, were burdensome. Gayla turned back toward the lawn. Let's go get some coffee. I heard they've got a back-to-school special at the Honey Pot. Iced caramel lattes with an ambrosia-flavored drizzle. She rubbed her hands together. Wait! Something else caught my eye, tucked away into the folds of the statue's robes. Is, is that an owl? Dom smiled brightly. It sure is. The mascot of Athena and Messenger of the Keepers. Well done, young grasshopper. According to the mortals, the first freshman to find the owl will become the valedictorian of her class. Too bad you're going to NYU. I put up my hand. Rewind that back. Owls are messengers of the keepers? Does that mean you all see them more often than mortals? Do you communicate with them? My mind flashed back to my many run-ins with little owl friends since I first arrived in New York. Each time, whoever I was with became very interested in whether or not I was communicating with the creatures. I'd shrugged it off before, but now, if it might be a sign that I actually was one of them... No. Dom shot my wishful thinking to bits. Before modern technology, the owls were used to help the races communicate with each other. They would deliver messages to and from Olympus, since the other races weren't able to get up there. Atlantean messengers, 
those with extreme speed or the ability to teleport between locations would complete the delivery back on Earth. Ah, uh, so they were little mailmen, but no one could actually communicate with them? Only Athena. It said she could speak with the owls, that they were her eyes and ears where she could not go. Interesting. Why do you ask? Gala turned her attention back to us. Dom stilled as well, appraising me. I tried to shake the thoughts free from my mind and shrugged. Just wondering. I wasn't about to divulge my recent interactions with the creatures. It's not like they were communicating with me. It was probably all a coincidence. Just wishful thinking, hoping it might have more significant meaning. So, about those lattes. Gala raised her brows. Let's get some. I fell into step behind her, thankful for the change in subject, and Gala's light-hearted willingness to move on and drop it. I wasn't sure if Dom dropped her curiosity quite as quickly, though. I swear, I felt her eyes on me as we made our way through the lush green trees and down the path that would take us back out into Morningside Heights. How much had she heard in my thoughts? Would she be willing to drop it, too? My question was answered a moment later as Dom persisted, continuing to talk up the wonders of Columbia. Her sales pitch grew stronger by the minute, and she watched my reactions closely. She was determined to get me to attend with them. You know, she said at last, you seem to have lots of questions about Keeper history. There's truly no other school you can attend that will offer as much information about your background as Columbia. I know you're set on NYU, but our Ancient Histories program would probably help you understand a lot more about who we are and what our purpose is. Even I'll admit that our history is pretty interesting. There are scandals that would blow your mind, Gala grinned. And there's an Atlantean professor who specializes in ancient languages. I paused, my hand subconsciously finding its way to my bag, where the tablet rested under my arm. Do you think... I didn't have to finish my sentence. Dom knew exactly what I was thinking. She suppressed a grin and shrugged, shoving her hands into the pockets of her denim shorts. Maybe you should enroll and find out. She winked and walked on ahead, following Gala out onto the busy street ahead. You know what? I think I'm going to head back to my aunt's house. You guys go ahead and get that coffee without me. I've got some things to think about. Chapter 36 Though some might call me stubborn, I like to think I was sensible. In fact, I prided myself on a strong sense of individualism. I was never one to succumb to peer pressure, and I wasn't about to start now. Even if Columbia did offer a warm feeling and a sense of home, even if I was intrigued by the programs it offered, the ancient languages and opportunities of an environment steeped in history— the professors and keeper classmates could be a real benefit if I eventually found some powers of my own, or they could be a real detriment if it turned out I was just a mortal, or worse, fractured. But no, I wouldn't think about that now. I couldn't allow myself to think that I might be fractured, or it would mean the textbook sitting at home was my gateway drug to dark magic, and I wouldn't go to the dark side— just like I wouldn't allow myself to be pressured into attending a university I never had any previous interest in. I didn't have to go to Columbia to work with the professor on languages. Perhaps I could meet with him after hours to learn more about the symbols on my tablet. I would attend NYU. I'd find my mom, ensure her safety, and carry on with life as normal. It sounded like a fine plan to me. Except life could never be normal again. As if the fates were really trying to drive that point home, I stopped to watch my snowy white owl friend flutter down to a street sign up ahead on the corner. I paused, looking to see if anyone else noticed the out-of-place creature, but my fellow New Yorkers were all too busy to care. I tilted my head at the bird, its sentient yellow eyes watching my every move. I didn't tell them about you. They would have thought I was nuts. It blinked, seemingly understanding my words. Are the legends true? Are you just an old mailman? 
The creature blinked again, and I chuckled, enjoying what seemed like an inside joke we shared. They don't know what they're talking about, do they? A woman walking down the sidewalk gripped her purse tighter and cast a wary glance in my direction as she picked up her pace and scurried away from me. You know, you're making me look like a weirdo talking to myself on a street corner. I swear the owl winked at me before turning its head down the street to my left and returning its wide eyes to mine. Then it flapped its wings, lifting two or three feet into the air and bobbing expectantly, never once moving its eyes away from mine. I looked around again. Surely I was imagining this, right? Why wasn't anyone else staring in wonder at this beautiful, intelligent creature? In the back of my mind, somehow I knew. It was here for me. The owl flapped ahead, flying twenty feet forward to another perch on a corner window in front of me. With one more glance over my shoulder, I trotted after it. As I approached the creature, it lifted off again, hovering once more to ensure I was paying attention, then it flew another ten or fifteen yards ahead. We played this game of cat and mouse, or mortal and owl, for a bit, until the bird bobbed its head and turned to look down a shady alleyway. We were several blocks from campus now, in an area I wasn't familiar with, but I'd seen enough TV shows to know I shouldn't go traipsing down dark alleyways. I'd either find singing cartoon cats banging on metal trash cans like drums, or more likely, find a man in a black ski mask ready to mug me. The owl blinked expectantly. Okay, I said, if you're sure it's safe. I took three hesitant steps, carefully dodging empty, wet fast food sacks and rat droppings. Ew, this place was gross. My owl friend flapped ahead to a filthy green dumpster. With a sigh, I continued after it, knowing with every step that I should probably be more cautious. Sean would be livid if he found out about this. Just a few feet away from the dumpster, I heard voices, too muffled to make out. I looked at the owl, who blinked and turned to face the other side of the alley. Is this what he was trying to show me? I inched closer, trying my best to stay quiet, which was no easy feat, especially when a cockroach the size of my hand nearly ran over the top of my foot. A makeshift shelter made from soggy cardboard boxes leaned against the side of the building the dumpster sat against. I tiptoed around it, peered around the corner, and just barely made out two separate voices. A man and a woman joyfully giggled in hushed tones. There was something almost familiar about them, but not enough for me to sort it out on sound alone. Just a few more steps to the next corner of the smelly bin, and I'd be able to see them. Of course, they'd be able to see me, too, but I was already this far. Why not go for the gold? They stopped talking as I poked the top of my head around the corner. Luckily for me, they were too busy sucking face to notice anyone at all. Who makes out by a dumpster? Another quick glance at the owl told me I had to stick around and find out. Well, add Peeping Tom to my list of accomplishments. The man leaned his back against the wall, rubbing his hands up and down the woman's slender frame as she lifted on her tiptoes to kiss him. Her hair was dark and stringy, hanging limply past her shoulders. Eventually, she dropped back down, revealing the man's face. We're gonna be so rich, Mr. Smiley grinned. It was David, the customer from Millie's shop, the one who bought the poison for supposedly non-poison-making purposes. So this was his girlfriend with the nerve pain. She stepped back, and I dashed around to the opposite side of the dumpster, diving into the cardboard lean-to. I could just barely make them out as they rounded the edge of the bin, and a gasp escaped my lips when I saw the face of the woman. It was Nikki, Abby's housekeeper the one who had given her father the investment information that Mr. Smiley had in his bag. I knew it. But my excitement was premature and over-enthusiastic. Did you hear something? The housekeeper paused, looking nervously around the alley. Probably just a rat, 
Mr. Smiley said. I wish the housekeeper would have accepted that as an answer, but I was never so lucky. She continued searching, stepping closer and closer to the cardboard shack where I'd holed up. My legs burned with energy and adrenaline, my fight or flight kicking in hardcore. Through a hole in the tattered roof, I could just barely see the outline of my owl friend hopping across the top of the dumpster. Then he disappeared, dropping down inside. The sound of scuffling claws immediately bounced through the walls of the alleyway. See? Mr. Smiley said. He put on a tough face, but there was a flash of fear in his eyes. Rats, and big ones from the sound of it. But there were no rats. It was just my owl and whatever was chasing him through the trash. A moment later, a feral flash of gray fur jumped out of the dumpster with a hiss and dashed across the alleyway, leaping up onto a fire escape on the opposite side and disappearing over the edge of a windowsill. Ah, I hate cats! The housekeeper jumped backward with a sour expression. She took one final look at the dumpster, her eyes barely grazing over the box where I sat hidden, and then took Mr. Smiley by the hand. Let's get out of here. I waited a solid five minutes after I was sure they were gone. It took that long for my pulse to return to normal. Slowly standing, I gave my legs a kick to get the blood rushing back through them properly, then peered over the edge of the dumpster. The odor was so strong, it brought tears to my eyes and stung at the back of my nose. No sign of the owl anywhere. It was just as well. He'd shown me what I needed to see. I wasted no time getting back to the coffee shop in Morningside Heights, only stopping once to pull up a Google map on my phone to find the way. I couldn't confirm anything, of course, but my suspicions were already running high when it came to Mr. Smiley and his purchase of Monk's Hood. Pair that with a shady new housekeeper and some sleazy-looking investment paperwork, and the situation was ripe for conspiracy. Maybe there was a chance I could save Mr. Mason after all. Chapter 37 Golden bells tinkled overhead as I pulled open the door of the honeypot. Coed sat huddled at tables and in worn armchairs throughout the small coffee shop. I scanned the room, trying to ignore the aromatic scent of espresso calling to me, like a seductively caffeine-laden temptress. There, two platinum blondes leaning in close over steaming mugs at a table in the back corner. I rushed breathlessly across the room. Dom! Gala! The girls looked up, faces twisted in confusion. Or perhaps those were sneers of disgust at the sweaty mortal who stood before them. I probably reeked of trash from the alley. With their ashy blonde, almost silver hair and deep, dark eyes, they had to be Olympian. They just weren't my Olympians. In fact, after another good look around, it appeared that everyone in the shop was a keeper of some kind. A gorgeous, leggy brunette with sparkling amber eyes leaned over the counter, grinning at me. "'Can I help you?' she asked. "'Maybe.' I wiped my sweaty palms across my thighs and approached her. I'd never interacted with a female Agarthian before. Was she going to try to make me fall in love with her, too? Surely not. They weren't all sirens, were they? I swallowed down my nerves and steadied my voice. I'm looking for a couple of, uh, blonde girls, about yay high. I held my hand six inches above my head. The girl unsuccessfully tried to hide a smirk. I think you've got the wrong shop. Haha, uh -huh, because I'm immortal. This was exactly why I'd never fit in at Columbia. I'm sure they said they were coming here. One of them probably ordered your special with the ambrosia drizzle. Real pretty girl, I'm sure you would remember her. The barista wrinkled her nose. Sorry, our special today is the iced white chocolate mocha. You've definitely got the wrong shop. I looked around again. There was no way I'd made a mistake. This place was crawling with keepers. She was just trying to get me out of there, trying to keep their identities a secret. Look, I leaned in conspiratorially, 
dropping my voice to let her know I wasn't going to blow her cover. I know what you think, but I'm not immortal. You're not, huh? A rough voice snagged my attention. I looked over in time to see Osborne slide onto a bar stool to my right. Crap, 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 crap. That's not exactly what I meant. I looked back to the barista for a little help, but she'd already moved on to help a new customer. Osborne did not look amused. His mouth pressed into a hard line. He dropped his chin toward the stool on the opposite side of his table. Oh, I can't, I backed up a step. I've really got to get back. Sit. His golden eyes flickered, and I couldn't resist. I had to sit. Somewhere in the depths of my consciousness, I knew he was glamoring me, but I was helpless to fight back. Okay, I murmured, sliding onto the stool across from him. The barista snickered, flicking a quick glance in our direction, before sliding an iced mocha to go across the counter to another unwitting mortal. First, I don't like liars. You're definitely a mortal, for now. Don't try to convince anyone otherwise. I didn't dare object. My heart was thundering so loud that I imagined the entire coffee shop could sense my fear. The two Atlantean guys at the table next to us could, anyway, judging by the wide eyes they had plastered to me. They probably had heightened senses, like Sean's friend Devon. I gave them an audible gulp for some comedic relief. They turned back to their own conversation, and any humor was immediately sucked dry from the situation again, as I looked at Osborne's golden eyes. While Tate's were rich like honey, full of mystery and intrigue, Osborne's were harsh, cold, and calculating. It was much more enjoyable to be glamoured by Tate. Osborne wasn't making this fun for me at all. Now I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you are going to answer each one quickly and truthfully. I don't have all day. I nodded, unable to object. Why are you here? I'm looking for my friends. The words spilled from my lips before I could help myself. Where's your guardian? Sean? I don't know. The AC blasted down on my clammy skin, sending chill bumps up my arms. Osborne glanced down, a wicked smirk playing at his lips. Are you afraid? Yes. Stupid traitorous mouth. You should be. It's dangerous to run around without your guardian. Why would you leave him behind, attempting to poison his mortal girlfriend, perhaps? No, I shook my head emphatically. I promise, it's not me. He pursed his lips, staring at me long and hard before scooting off of his bar stool. I'm watching you, everywhere. One slip up and you're mine. What about Tate? It was strange how I felt defensive of the guy who admittedly wanted to kill me and take my soul. But Osborne wasn't playing by the rules. He wasn't supposed to come near another hunter's assignment without him, and I wanted him to know that I was aware of his mistake. His eyes narrowed. I don't care about Thaddeus. I care about getting the job done. He turned on his heels and disappeared through the door before I could get another word in. At least he knew I wasn't responsible for Mr. Mason's illness now. There's no way I could have lied to him through the glamour. But I also didn't get a chance to tell him what I suspected about Mr. Smiley and the housekeeper. Not that he would have listened to me anyway. The Atlantean boys stared at me with raised brows. Nothing to see here, I muttered, as I stormed past them. It took me just a moment to regain my bearings back on the sidewalk outside of the coffee shop. There was no sign of Osborne, but I knew he was near. I could practically feel his eyes burning into me. I grinned like a fool, trying to prove I wasn't afraid of him. Take that, you pushy hunter. Gala and Dom's apartment wasn't far from the honeypot. Ten minutes later, I banged on their door, relief flooding through me when I saw Gala's pretty face peek through the crack. Everly, come in. She stepped back, slurping a creamy iced coffee drink through her straw. 
Dom glanced up from her spot at the kitchen island, immediately aware of the stress I was trying to keep under control. She stood and met us in the living room. What's wrong, Ev? I need to find Tate. Gayla wriggled her brows at me. I bet you do. No, this is important. Dom's eyes moved quickly back and forth over mine, trying to make out what was flashing through my mind. Bless her. It was probably a mess in there. You ran into Osborne? Alone? Her mouth dropped open. Yes, and I think I have the information he needs to help Abby's dad. I know who is responsible for it, but he won't listen to me. I need to tell Tate. Gayla tensed at my mention of Abby, but she nodded, agreeing that something needed to be done. Osborne is kind of a creep. I understand why you'd rather talk to Tate, but I don't know if I'd recommend you running to him. Isn't that a bit like a rabbit seeking refuge in the fox's den? I'd rather talk to the fox than the wolf. She nodded grimly at that. Tell us what you know, Dom suggested. Maybe we can talk to Tate and Osborne for you. I shook my head. No, he needs to hear it from me. I'm still working to prove my innocence here, but I also have first-hand knowledge. If they glamour the truth out of me, or whatever it is they do, they'll have to believe me. The girls exchanged a wary look. Gala caved first. Okay, I know where the Agarthians hang out in the evenings. I'm sure Tate will be there. Osborne might be there too, though. I was sure he probably would be, but that was a risk I'd just have to take. Chapter 38 the city buzzed with a new kind of energy after sundown. I stepped out of the cab behind Gala, who stood tall on a sidewalk in the Lower East Side, skin shimmery and perfectly bronzed, as the streetlights reflected off of her exposed shoulders. She turned to Dom and me with a grin. I love this place. Have you been before? Dom asked. Gala nodded. Yep. Gabriella let me sneak down here with her and her friends one night a couple of years ago. It's where I got my first sip of absinthe. Daddy would have killed me if he knew, but it was worth it. She was way more excited than I was. I struggled to keep up with their long, confident strides through the streets, and I tripped over my feet more than once for lack of paying attention. I was too busy scouting out my surroundings. If this was a popular Agarthian hangout... There were no telling how many hunters might be in the area. Dom slowed and patted me on the shoulder as I caught up. It's all right, she said. We've got your back. It was good to have them on my side, but I was beginning to regret not inviting Sean along. A weak seer and a telepath could only do so much. Sean's strength and speed would have been far more useful, but Sean wouldn't have been on board with me finding Tate. As a guardian, his job was to keep me away from the Agarthians, not lead me into one of their favorite hangouts. Here, Gala said, pointing down a dark alleyway. Are you sure? Memories of almost getting caught in a similar alleyway earlier that day surfaced, and I shuddered at the thought of rats and roaches and other nasties that lurked in places like this. Positive. She marched onward, and after a shared glance with Dom, we followed. It was quiet, but not as gross as the place I hid earlier. It didn't smell like a rotten dumpster, for one thing, but it also had almost a tidy feel to it. Or as tidy as a dark alleyway in New York City could feel, anyway. Here we go. After you, ladies. Gala extended her arm to a dark stairwell that led down to an unmarked door below street level. Uh, nope. You can go first. I insist. Dom giggled as I halted at the top of the stairs, grabbing onto the railings like a cat refusing a bath. You can still wait here if you want. We'll go see if we can find Tate and bring him up here to you. No, I'll be fine. The alley didn't seem so bad when I was with friends, but that certainly didn't mean I wanted to hang out here alone. Reluctantly, I released the rails and tiptoed after them down the stairs. A small bell hung outside of the metal door at the bottom. I searched for signage or windows, anything to indicate what we could expect to find on the other side, 
But there was nothing, just the bell. Gala gave it a ring, and its sound was tinny in the cool night air. A square peephole cover slid open to reveal a dark, beady eye on the other side of the door. State your business. The voice was nasally and apathetic. We're here for the vault. Gala was practically glowing with excitement as she turned and gave us an enthusiastic thumbs up. The peephole closed, and the sound of something scraping across the floor was followed by the door swinging open. I stepped inside after Gala, noting the step stool just to our left. It was one of the few items in the small, dank room we'd entered, and it sat lonely on the dirty linoleum floor. A squatty woman with frizzy, graying brown hair was waddling back to a warped, cheap wooden table stained with water rings. She climbed up into her chair and picked up the four-inch thick book she was reading. I couldn't tell what it was, but there were definitely spaceships on the cover. I raised my brows at Gala. Her grin stretched even wider, and she gave a confident nod of her head toward a bookshelf built into the opposite wall. The woman, who had just seemed to notice our delay, peered over the pages of her book. The fluorescent light flickering over her head highlighted the stray white hairs that had escaped her ponytail and now bobbed like unruly little dancers in the wind of her fan buzzing in the corner. Was there something else you needed? Her tone was laced with irritation. She probably wanted to get back to her book. No, thank you. We're going. Gala moved toward the bookshelf and gave us a wink before pulling out a ratty old book with a burgundy spine. The title had faded to nothing but specks of gold, but it wasn't important. The book merely served as a trigger for the mechanism that was now swinging the bookshelf open and to the side to reveal the secret area behind it. The vault is an old Prohibition-era bar hidden down here under the city. They used to store liquor here where it wouldn't be found and confiscated. Now it's just a hot spot for keepers, primarily Agarthians, to kick back and enjoy themselves away from mortal eyes, Gala explained. But the woman who let us in was a mortal, right? Yeah, but she's glamoured. She'll forget everything about the strangeness of her job every night before she goes home. Then she'll return to do it again tomorrow. Don't worry about her, though. She gets to read every book on the old shelves, and they pay her well. We followed Gala through the opening into a slightly larger warm space on the other side. Tufted Victorian couches and armchairs sat huddled together in small pairings through the room. An exposed brick wall held a glowing fireplace, adding to the ambiance as the reflection of its flames danced across the intricacies of the metal ceiling tiles overhead. A large mahogany bar sat at the far wall, next to a small stage where a jazz band was set up but not currently playing. The room was nearly at capacity, with just twenty or thirty patrons, all unnaturally beautiful and carefree. Well, carefree until their golden eyes all turned to me. I immediately felt a surge of electricity jolt through my limbs. This was a mistake, I whispered to Gala. I shouldn't be here. Too late now, she whispered back. Then she smiled and waved to a gorgeous, dark-skinned woman standing nearby. I moved to follow her over there, but a strange tug in my chest urged me to turn to my left instead. We're right here if you need us, Dom said, squeezing my arm. Then she left me alone, staring like a fool at my future murderer. Tate stalked across the room, long feline-like strides that brought him to my side in a matter of seconds. What are you doing here? The sound of his voice sent a tickle down my spine. He tried to sound intimidating, but it came off a little too caring. I almost sensed a touch of concern in his tone. I came to find you, actually. The corner of his mouth twitched up into a shadow of a grin. You're still mortal. His eyes trailed my figure, as though he could see my fragility radiating off of me. So I know you're not here to offer your soul to me. What else could you possibly need? His golden eyes glistened with amusement. 
I didn't fully understand Tate's game, but he obviously felt like he was winning, and the flutter in my belly led me to believe he was probably right about that, though it wasn't unpleasant. An ensemble of musicians resumed their spot on the stage, dressed as a jazz band might have dressed in the 1920s. A woman in a shimmery, black, knee-length cocktail dress stepped up to the microphone and began to sing. The song was like nothing I'd ever heard. In fact, I'm not even sure I was hearing it with my ears. It moved me within my soul. Every fear I had immediately dissipated. My stress was gone. I swayed to the music, entranced by each exquisite note, feeling lighter and lighter with every word the woman sang. Everly. The sound of Tate's voice, rich with honey, snapped my attention back to him. He was truly a magnificent creature, towering over me with his broad shoulders and slender waist, hands in his pockets. He cleared his throat, pulling my gaze away from his chest and back up to his glistening golden eyes. But I couldn't even be embarrassed. The song wouldn't allow it. All I felt was pure contentment. You like this song? He asked with a grin. Very much. When had I reached out to him? I looked at my hand, sliding down his shoulder and the ridges of his bicep like it belonged to someone else. I would never be so bold as to reach out and feel a man's muscles, but I was. Everly, Dom pulled me away. We've got to get you out of here. You're not strong enough to resist the pull of the siren song. I don't want to go. I looked back at the beautiful man beside me. Tate looked like he was suppressing a laugh. Dom turned to him next. Come on, we need to talk to you. It's important. She dragged me back to the bookshelf, which held celebrity memorabilia on this side of the wall. Go ahead, she said to Tate. Pull the secret lever or whatever. He twisted a signed portrait of Cary Grant, and the shelf came to life again. I turned longingly back toward the warm room with the enchanting music we were leaving behind, but another tug from Dom pulled me into the blinking fluorescent lights of the room we'd first entered. The bored mortal with the space novel glanced in our direction. Do something with her, Dom commanded, waving her hand in the direction of the confused woman. To my surprise, Tate obeyed. He approached her as the shelf swung back into place behind us. With the sound of the music muffled out, I regained my ability to concentrate and think clearly. I was filled with great curiosity as Tate leaned across the old table and touched the small woman's arm. We're going to talk, and you can't hear anything we say for the next ten minutes. You're going to read your book, and you won't even know we're here. There is nothing unusual taking place tonight. The woman pulled her book back in front of her and looked down at its pages without so much as acknowledging a word Tate said. Are you sure that worked? I asked. Tate nodded. Unbelieving, I clapped my hands together while simultaneously shouting, Hey! The woman didn't even flinch. Satisfied? Tate smirked. I guess so. I shuffled, uncomfortable now that the glamour of the siren song had worn off, and I realized how strangely I'd behaved moments earlier. But we only had ten minutes, so I had to cut to the chase. Look, I need to talk to you about something important. I know it's not technically your case to solve, but I think I have a lead on the dark magic incident with Mr. Mason. Tate shook his head. You need to talk to Osborne about that. I can't. When he tracked me down this afternoon, he made it clear that he wouldn't hear a word I had to say. He doesn't trust me. Osborne tracked you down today? Yes. Tate's jaw tightened just for the briefest of moments, before he relaxed it again, but he couldn't hide the fists he still held clenched at his side. I knew Osborne had crossed a line, and thankfully, Tate seemed open to hearing me out now. I think I know who the fractured soul is. I think it's Mr. Mason's housekeeper, and she has an accomplice. Gala emerged from behind the bookshelf then, 
just in time for me to relay everything I'd seen between the housekeeper and Mr. Smiley. And within minutes, we had a plan. Hopefully it would work, and hopefully Sean wouldn't be too angry with me when all was said and done. Chapter 39 My mind was racing a million miles an hour the next morning as I skipped down the stairs on my way to Millie's shop. Sean waited for me outside the door, oblivious to everything that had taken place the day before. Thank goodness he wasn't a mind reader, too. There was no way I'd be able to hide my anxiety. I joined him on the sidewalk with an enthusiastic grin and patted him roughly on the shoulder. Hey, buddy, what's up? Having a good morning so far? Too much. Play it cool. Sean made a face. How many cups of coffee have you had? Just the right amount, I giggled, trying to act normal and nearly choked on my spit. He shook his head. Whatever. I'm fine, I guess. But I really do need to get my schedule figured out. Have you nailed yours down yet? He began walking toward the apothecary, but I stayed put. Oh, shoot. I put a hand to my forehead. No, actually. I was meaning to talk to you about that. I accidentally left my pen at Abby's apartment the other day when Millie and I went to see her dad. He stopped and looked over his shoulder at me. So? So it's my lucky pen. I need it to help me make a list of the classes I'm interested in. He made that same face as before. Sean definitely thought I was some kind of special this morning. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I just don't think I'll be able to get my schedule sorted out until I can get that pen back. Is there any way we might be able to swing by her place before we head into the shop? I clasped my hands together in front of my chest and batted my eyes like a cartoon. Pretty please? Seriously? For a pen? Sean huffed and glanced down at his watch. I don't think we have time. Maybe you can come back with Millie later. Nonsense. She won't mind if we're a little late. And I'm sure she doesn't want to walk all the way back over there after working all day. I'd go by myself, but they might not like it if I ditch my guardian again. He grimaced. I knew he wasn't excited about going to see Abby, which I had to admit was pretty confusing. He loved to be around her. Then again, maybe that was just it. He didn't trust himself not to fall more in love with her, and that was definitely forbidden. Fine, but we'll need to get in and out as quickly as possible. I drew an X over my heart. Promise, I'll be fast as lightning. We picked up our speed in the opposite direction, back toward Abby's building. I tried to keep a straight face, but the truth was that I was giddy that my plan was working. And if the others were doing their parts, then we would see them any minute now. Sean! Everly! Gala marched over and threw her arms around us in a three-way hug while Dom smirked behind her on the sidewalk. We just rounded the corner of Abby's block, and they were waiting exactly where they said they'd be. The plan was still moving as smooth as silk. Sean pulled away, flustered. He ran a hand through his hair and frowned. Why are you two all the way over in this part of town? We heard about this amazing new donut shop. They've invented something called a Kranglish muffnut that is supposedly to die for. It's a cross between a croissant, an English muffin, and a donut, and it was featured in... Sean waved her off just in time. I was about to lose it. I bit the inside of my lip hard to keep from laughing out loud. The thrill of the chase had me jazzed, and Gala's made-up breakfast treat was too bizarre to handle. Dom shook her head, dropping her face toward the ground to hide her smirk. Well, we'll let you get to your breakfast, then. We're in kind of a hurry. Sean cut around Gala to keep moving toward the apartment building. The green awning over the door was just a few yards ahead. We'll walk with you, Gayla replied, undeterred by Sean's attempt to shake her off. I think the donut place is down the block somewhere over here. Where are you guys going anyway? Everly left a pen inside one of these apartments. We're going to grab it before heading back to Millie's shop this morning. He cut his eyes over to me, not even attempting to hide his frustration over the matter. A pen? 
Gayla raised her brows in my direction. We hadn't discussed exactly how I was going to lure Sean back to Abby's place. I had to think quickly this morning. It's my lucky pen, I shrugged. I need it to help me narrow down which classes I'm going to enroll in. It's never let me down before. Gayla resumed her straight face as she launched into some long story about a lucky keychain she got when she turned 16. I appreciated her backing me up. That and what I discovered was an incredible storytelling ability she possessed. Dom winked in my direction as we slowed in front of the doorway. I knew what had to happen next. Well, here we are, said Sean. Enjoy your pastries. But the girls didn't budge. Whose place did you say this was? Gayla asked. He didn't, and it was probably intentional. This is where Abby lives, I said. Sean shifted nervously on his feet. Abby? As in Sean's good friend, Abby? Oh, I'd love to meet her. I've heard so much about her. Mind if we go up with you? No, I mean, yes, I do mind. You can't come up. The color drained from Sean's already pale face. I'd never seen him look quite as uncomfortable as he did at the prospect of Gayla and Abby meeting each other. Her father isn't feeling well. I shot Sean a sympathetic look. As far as I could tell, he didn't suspect anything unusual about our chance meeting with the girls. Well, maybe he would like a muff nut. We should get one for Abby, too. You can bring it to her, Sean. Gayla smiled sweetly. She was a really great actress, too. If I didn't already know how difficult it was for her to think about Sean and Abby together, I wouldn't have noticed the pain behind her eyes at all. Sean looked like he was going to be sick. Bringing Abby breakfast would definitely send her the wrong ideas. You know what? Maybe Dom and I can go up together. You two can stay down here, and since neither of us are close enough to chit-chat with Abby, we can make it quick. We'll be right back. I pulled Dom by the elbow before Sean could object. It would only take a second for him to see through my weak reasoning, but I couldn't think of any other way to get Dom upstairs with me, and I needed Dom there. Abby opened her door a few minutes later with wide eyes. Oh, she said, startled. Where's Sean? He's catching up with a friend he ran into on the sidewalk outside. This is Dom. Abby's forehead wrinkled as she glanced between us, but she stepped back and allowed us inside. Sean and I had sent a text before we left to let her know we were on our way. I looked everywhere, but I didn't see any pens, she said. Hmm, maybe your housekeeper saw it somewhere. I pushed past her toward the kitchen. The couch was empty, which probably meant Mr. Mason was in bed. Stay strong, big guy, I thought to myself. We'll get you feeling better soon. Nikki, the stringy-haired housekeeper, stood in the kitchen, wiping down the counters. She glanced up nervously as I approached, likely remembering that I was related to Millie. Hi! I leaned forward onto the freshly wiped granite, leaving elbow smudges on its glossy surface. I'm Abby's friend Everly. I think I left my pen here the other day when I stopped by with my aunt. You might know her, Millie. She's a pharmacist at the apothecary near Central Park. Anyway, have you seen it? The housekeeper's breathing quickened, her chest visibly rising and falling before us. She was nervous. Good. I glanced at Dom to see if she was getting anything from the woman's thoughts just yet, but I couldn't tell. Time to turn it up a notch. I think I set it down on the counter right here. I remember there was some kind of an investment folder by it, yellow and blue. The logo looked kind of cheesy, like some con artist had designed it. I laughed, pretending I'd made an innocent joke. I'm kidding, of course. I'm sure it was totally legit. But that pen, did you see it? It's kind of special to me. I haven't seen any pen. The kitchen light reflected off the sheen across the housekeeper's forehead as she stormed past us on her way to the other side of the apartment. Dom half smirked and gave a subtle nod to let me know she got what she needed. Well, maybe I was wrong. I must have left it somewhere else. Thanks anyway, Abby. Take care of yourself. 
I smiled and turned back to the door. Uh, you too. The girl looked completely bewildered as she led us back out into the hall. Good luck finding it. She closed the door and I immediately turned to Dom. Get anything good? She grinned. You were right about everything. Well, almost everything. But the housekeeper is the accomplice. Your Mr. Smiley is a fractured one. And I know just how we can get this sucker and make him pay. Chapter 40 Sean abandoned all efforts to converse with me about midway through the day. I couldn't focus on a word he said. I was too busy obsessively checking my phone to see if a text had come through from the girls. Dom said the housekeeper planned to meet up with Mr. Smiley after work. Gayla was grabbing Tate while Dom kept watch on the apartment building all day. As soon as she saw the housekeeper leave, she was going to text me to meet up with them. Then we'd confront her and Smiley Loverboy in the alley where my hot hunter Tate could do his job. Though I chose not to think too much about what that might entail, I wasn't particularly excited about the whole soul extraction part of the plan. I just wanted to ensure Mr. Mason's safety. My pocket buzzed with a new message. Ip! Sean jerked his head in my direction at the squeak that slipped through my mouth. I quickly tried to regain my composure. Clearing my throat, I straightened my face the best that I could and said, Hey, I've got to go. Just got an SOS text from Dom. What kind of SOS? Is she in danger? He was already pulling off his apron. No, no, no danger. I lifted both hands in front of me. It's just, uh, girl problems. Sean wrinkled his nose. Enough said. But I still can't let you go alone. Go where? Millie emerged from the back room with a cheerful grin. Dom's having some feminine issues. She asked me to swing by. Millie's brows lifted. Oh, well, you should definitely go then. It's pretty slow here today. I'll be fine on my own. But here. She wrestled with something under the counter before emerging with a small white paper gift sack. Take her some dark chocolate and this lavender sage salve. It'll fix up to 99% of those pesky lady cramps. Sean grimaced. Okay, okay, let's go. He could barely keep up with me as I trotted along the sidewalk. Is it really this big of an emergency? Totally. Keep up. We were about eight blocks away from the apothecary when he realized we weren't headed to Dom's apartment. Hey, stop. Where are you taking me? Hmm? I played innocent and continued moving forward, pretending I didn't hear him. Everly, come on. You've been a little off all day. Tell me what's really going on here. Fine. We're catching the fractured soul that's been poisoning Mr. Mason. I grinned. He was going to find out soon enough anyway. We're what? Uh-uh. That's not our job. And you especially shouldn't go near any fractured souls. Why not? Are they contagious or something? I picked up my pace despite Sean's objections. No, but if the excitement or fear of the capture somehow sets off your powers, you're going to be surrounded by hunters. What do you think they're going to do then? I paused. The thought hadn't crossed my mind. We won't be surrounded by hunters. There's only one. Just Tate. Thaddeus is the only one you need to fear. Good grief, Everly. Did you honestly not think this through at all? Come on. He grabbed my arm. We're heading back. An owl fluttered down with an exaggerated flap of its wings and landed on a trash can beside us. It focused its deep yellow eyes on Sean with a look that even he couldn't ignore. You need to let go of my arm. I glanced from him to my little owl friend, making my point clear. The owl blinked once at Sean before he released me. Fine, he muttered. But let the record show that I do not support this plan. Not at all. He shot another uneasy glance at the bird. You'll still protect me, though, right? If anything goes wrong? Of course I will. But then I'm going to chew you out about it real good when we get you back to safety. I ruffled my hand through his auburn hair. 
Thanks, I knew I could count on you. The owl flew away and I checked my text once more. We're almost there. Dom just sent an update that they are meeting in an alley not much further from here. They who? The fractured soul. Remember the smiley guy we helped a couple of times at the apothecary? The one who always bought black licorice? Oh yeah, black licorice guy. You're not telling me he's the one poisoning Mr. Mason, are you? Yep, he's the bad guy. And get this, Abby's housekeeper is helping him do it. I explained everything as we walked, right up until I saw the tall young woman standing against the wall up ahead. Gala was the opposite of inconspicuous. She wore black leather leggings and a long-sleeved black turtleneck in August. Her oversized sunglasses covered half of her face, but her long blonde hair fell across her shoulders in almost silvery waves. Stealth! I waggled my eyebrows, and she flashed me a huge, perfect gala grin. Thanks. I was going for a Mission Impossible vibe. Sean rolled his eyes. So where are they? Dom and the guys are around the corner, watching Mr. Smiley and the housekeeper. Osborne refused to take our word for it, so he wants to listen in on their conversation before he makes any moves. Osborne is here? Gala cringed. I thought Dom told you. Dom didn't tell her, but I totally called it. Sean gave me a stern look. It's fine, I said. I'll be fine. I wasn't sure if I was trying to reassure my friends or myself. But fine or not, there was no turning around now. We slunk around the corner and spotted our small group of keepers up ahead. Osborne turned as we rounded the corner and pierced me with his pale golden eyes. Dom, sensing my fear, turned and frowned apologetically. I couldn't let them get me worked up, though. Not if the extreme stress might bring on any powers I could still potentially be harboring. How's it going? I looked only at Dom. Osborne was a creep, and Tate had me all tingly without even making eye contact. The housekeeper is panicking. You really scared her earlier. She's trying to get Smiley to act fast before you tell your Aunt Millie. Act fast on what? I swallowed, hoping her response was anything other than what I suspected. Killing Mr. Mason so they can steal his new inheritance. It was Osborne who answered, looking more lethal than ever. Shoot. I guess it's now or never, then. I risked a quick glance at Tate. He nodded, the corner of his mouth quirking into a half-grin, but it quickly faded as Osborne began to speak. They may have been fellow hunters, but that did not mean they were on friendly terms, and part of me suspected I might have had something to do with this new animosity between the two of them. I would be flattered if they were fighting over anything other than who gets to kill me and take my soul first. You girls stay here, while Tate and I go talk to them. We've got a station nearby, an abandoned loft over an old empty storefront. We can finish the job there. What about me? Sean asked. Apparently, now that he was here, he wanted to join in on the mission after all. Finesse, right? Osborne looked Sean up and down. That's right. Then it's your job to catch them if they try to get away. They won't try to get away, not with my glamour, Tate smirked. I wasn't referring to the suspects. Osborne glowered at me. So you really think you can just go out there and convince them to follow you back to your station to kill them? Won't they know you're hunters? I asked. We can be very convincing. Tate winked at me. Watch and learn. The two Agarthians sauntered down the alleyway. Smiley jerked his head up fast at the sight of them, his body tensed, prepared to sprint, but Osborne raised his hands. Slow down there, Osborne said. His voice was smooth and calming. Smiley froze. We're just here to talk. The housekeeper was too busy ogling Tate to care much about what was happening between Osborne and her boyfriend. She looked like she'd just seen an angel, and she was welcoming him with open arms, literally. The poor woman stepped forward trying to hug Tate. Sheesh. 
I hoped I didn't look quite so desperate when he glamoured me. I couldn't hear the conversation after that. They were too far away. What's going on? I asked Dom. She shrugged. They're too far away for me to hear anything either. A few minutes passed. Then the whole group of four began walking back toward us. Smiley wasn't smiling anymore, but he obediently followed Osborne, never once pulling his gaze away from the back of the hunter's head. And the housekeeper, bless her heart, looked like she'd just received a puppy on Christmas morning. She had a death grip on Tate's hand. He winked at me as they approached. He was having way too much fun messing with her emotions, and he wanted me to see how easy it was to manipulate her, just like he could manipulate me. Jerk. All right, thanks for the help, Osborne said to Dom and Gala. He ignored me, and it was the best thing he could have done. I didn't need his gratitude or praise for my expert sleuthing. I just wanted him to forget I ever existed. You all can go back now. We've got everything under control. Wait, I said. What about the housekeeper? She wasn't fractured. She wasn't very nice, but she certainly didn't deserve to die. Me and Tate are moving back to Jersey, aren't we, babe? She puckered her lips and glued herself to his arm. Gala snorted, and Tate looked amused, but he was focused on me, not the housekeeper. Guess he still wasn't comfortable enough to let his real prey out of sight. Who cares about her? Osborne said gruffly. Let's go. They pushed past us, and I stepped right into line behind them. Osborne paused, turning to glare at me. I said, you're dismissed. Run along. He shooed me away with his hand. No. I straightened my shoulders. From the corner of my eye, I saw Sean shake his head, embarrassed. I want to see how this is done. Tate frowned. I don't think you do. I put up a hand. Don't try to glamour me out of this. I may be new to this world, but if you're planning on doing the same thing to me that you're going to do to Mr. Frowny here, I think I deserve to see how it works, don't I? I really wanted to make sure they weren't going to hurt the housekeeper, but as much as I hated to admit it, there was a sick part of me that was curious about the process of soul extraction, too. First dark magic, now soul extraction— I was definitely playing in the darker part of the morally gray area I normally avoided. You don't deserve anything, Osborne spat. But if you want to have nightmares, be my guest. It won't change your future either way. Tate opened his mouth to speak, but thought better of it. Dom quirked an eyebrow. Was there something else you wanted to say? I was probably mouthing off a little too harshly, given the current circumstances, but who could blame me for feeling a little moody? I was about to watch the hunters kill a man the same way they intended to kill me. No, Tate relaxed his features. Follow us. Chapter 41 The loft containing the hunters' station looked like every other abandoned warehouse where hostages were taken in every thriller movie ever. I half expected them to blindfold him and tie him to a chair in the middle of the empty space so they could kick him and fail to extract information. But that wasn't necessary. Frowny was glamoured. He'd do anything Osborne asked of him. And the housekeeper would probably do anything Tate asked, even if he removed the glamour. She was a smitten kitten. Sean and the girls accompanied me to the loft with the Agarthians. It was slightly less terrifying with them by my side, but frightening nonetheless. Osborne slid into a rolling chair in front of a folding table containing a closed laptop. Frowny stood right in front of him, straight-faced and apathetically awaiting his impending demise. A pleasant buzz spread from my shoulder down through my left arm, and I turned to see Tate approaching from the side. He leaned in close to whisper in my ear, his hand blooming warmth from where it lightly rested on my shoulder blade. It's not too late. Not too late for what? To leave? I told you I want to see how this works. He left his hand on my back for a moment longer without speaking. Then finally he muttered, If you insist. 
I shivered from the cold left behind when he pulled away. Part of me wished he'd come back and maybe even hold on to me a little more. Whether it was all an illusion or not, his presence was a welcome comfort. But I had to learn to be brave. I'd find my own strength. The housekeeper stood on the opposite side of Tate. Are you doing all right? I asked her. I wasn't sure how glamour worked, but it must have been strange for her on some level. At least it seemed like it would be. Never better, sweetheart. She grinned widely and looked longingly at Tate. That glamour was some strong stuff. Maybe I'd underestimated just how powerful Tate really was. I'd have to give Sean some extra thanks later for keeping me safe. I understood better now why he insisted on following me everywhere I went. Osborne leaned forward onto his knees, giving Mr. Frowny a hard once-over. Just to confirm, I want you to tell me what you've been doing to Mr. Mason. I've been creating a slow-acting poison that Nicky has been putting into his coffee every day. Why? Osborne seemed bored, like discovering plans for premeditated murder was a daily occurrence for him. Because we want to take his money. It was too easy to make him spill the truth with their glamour. Was there anything they couldn't do with the power of persuasion? How? Nicky answered this time. Mr. Mason is growing anxious as his illness worsens. He wants to make sure his daughter is well taken care of when he passes away, so we introduced him to a new investment scheme. He's going to place his entire inheritance into our business so it can grow for his daughter. But once he wires the money, we'll finish him off and run. And who taught you to use your magic to create the poisons? Rasputin, Frowny said. I liked him better when he was smiley. The glee over his evil plan made it easy for me to crave justice against him. But seeing him blank-faced, with that slight frown and zero control over his own actions, I almost felt sorry for the man. I glanced around to see what everyone else thought, and immediately felt a fire when I locked eyes with Tate. How long had he been watching me? He was probably dreaming of the day he'd get to do this to me, too sadistic creep. Rasputin. The shock in Osborne's words immediately drew my attention back to the situation at hand. Impossible. He looked at Sean. Right? As far as I know, yeah, unless there's someone else with the same name. Osborne, now slightly paler, sat tall and cleared his throat. Tell me more about Rasputin. I don't know him well. Frowny began. I followed my cousin to a big meeting in Philly last year. He knew I could do strange things with my body. Scars would fade. Wounds would heal overnight. Crazy powerful stuff. And he thought I might be able to meet some like-minded people at this event. Rasputin was there. He drew a big crowd. A lively group of people dressed like witches and vampires from history. Rasputin's costume was good, real beard, solid Russian accent. He gave a lecture on poisons, taught a couple of spells to enact them in ways modern medicine can't. Undetectable, he said. He also taught us some spells to prevent the effects of poison on us. Real weird stuff. But it works. It worked for me, anyway. My cousin Larry couldn't do anything with it. Sean and Osborne exchanged wary looks. Have you been in contact with him at all since the event? Osborne asked. Frowny shook his head. Do you have a card or anything with his contact information? Any way we could reach him? No, I didn't get a good feeling from the guy, so I didn't ever plan to talk to him again. Okay. Osborne stood and pulled what looked like a small silver cigar box from his pocket. It couldn't have been more than six inches long, with intricate designs carved into all four sides. The bottom was smooth, but the top had otherworldly letters set into the lid. They weren't quite the same ancient letters from my tablet, but they definitely weren't anything I'd ever seen before. 
Osborne covered the lid with his palm, closed his eyes, and began murmuring something under his breath. Then a clean metal click sounded through the air, and I noticed two sharp needles protruding from the top edge of the box. They were thicker than the needles on standard syringes, and nearly twice as long. He approached Frowny, who stood tall and unafraid. With the box in one hand, he placed his other palm against Frowny's cheek. The man smiled again, his cheeks flushed. It's time to go, Osborne said quietly. I stepped forward, but Dom grabbed my arm. My heart was racing, my vision blurring around the edges. I was having a panic attack. They were about to kill him. He didn't even get to say goodbye to his cousin Larry. I clutched my chest and turned to my friend. It's okay, she whispered. He's not in pain. It has to be this way. Osborne raised the box, and before I could look away again, plunged both needles directly into the man's neck. He didn't falter, didn't sway, didn't fight back. He looked at peace, in fact, happy. Osborne continued to whisper words I couldn't hear, and after about thirty seconds, he removed the needles from his neck, and they withdrew back into the box. Mr. Frowny, or maybe he was Mr. Smiley again, though he wasn't quite smiling either, dropped gently to his knees. He rested there, alone on the floor, expressionless and silent. "'What happened to him?' I asked, breathless. "'They took his soul,' Dom replied. "'That's it? It was so easy. "'What now? What about his body?' The life will fade from it over the next several minutes, but there's no soul, no intelligent life to feel any pain or fear. Tate's hand found its way to my back again, and my muscles relaxed. He should probably have the opposite effect on me, but at this moment I didn't care. I appreciated the help he provided in calming my tense nerves. I inspected the fractured man's body more closely. He looked completely normal and alive, though more tired now. Aside from the two holes in his neck, there was no sign of any foul play at all. Tate leaned closer, whispering only to me. The Agarthian cleaning crew will be by to dispose of the body soon. He'll be a missing persons case here in the mortal world until the humans forget about him, and his fractured soul will rest in the Hall of Souls in Agartha until we can find a missing piece to complete it. I pulled away from him. You're killing these people so you can Frankenstein new souls back together again? And that works? They don't know if it works or not, Sean grumbled. Tate shot him a dirty look. I put up my hand. I couldn't think about that anymore right now, not when Smiley's girlfriend stood just six feet away with that sad puppy dog look in her eyes. Will you at least take care of her? I nodded to the woman. Tate sighed, pulling his glare away from Sean. He gingerly approached the housekeeper, then softly whispered, I can't go to Jersey with you, but you're going to go there alone, right now. You're going to forget everything you saw today. You're going to forget about your boyfriend, the Mason family, and the entire world of the Keepers. None of this ever happened. Go home and start a new life. She nodded and immediately turned to leave. What about Mr. Mason? Sean asked. He'll be fine, I said. The poison may take some time to fully leave his system, but he'll be fully recovered in a couple of weeks. Osborne cut his eyes accusingly in my direction. I shrugged. I work in an apothecary, and my aunt is a healer. I've been reading up on the poisons and how they are affected by the spells jotted down in Millie's book. Herbs that did nothing for common mortals could be completely transformed with a little healer magic and a few Latin phrases. I need to see Abby. Sean's eyes were glassy with unshed tears of joy. Of course, I said. I'll stick with the girls, I promise. Swing by their place after you're finished. We'll talk more there. And remember to keep your mouth shut with Abby, Gala said. 
Her tone wasn't unfriendly, but there was definitely a slightly bitter note to her words. You don't want to reveal any secrets, she winked. Sean dashed out the door and we moved to follow him, but Tate's warm hand on my shoulder stopped me. You okay? he asked. What do you care? He grinned. The process works best when the souls are at ease. I just wanted to make sure it didn't scare you. I need you to be nice and relaxed when your day comes. I scoffed. If my day comes, I'd sure hate to clog up your hall of horrors with the gross little mortal soul. His golden eyes flashed slightly in the low light of the warehouse. Oh, I'm not worried about that at all. Your powers will show themselves eventually, broken as they may be, and I'll be ready. Come on, Everly. Gala stepped up to my side, looping my arm through hers. Dom did the same on my opposite side. Let's head back to the honey pot and grab some caffeine. Let the hunters clean up their carcass like the savages they are. The girls spun me around and kept me upright until we were back on the street. Thank you for getting me out of there. That's what we do, girl, Gala smiled. You know, we make a pretty good team. Just think of all the fun we could have if you were to enroll at Columbia with us. I've been thinking about that, actually. You said there's a professor of the ancient languages there, right? Yep, Dom nodded. And I could learn more about our history. Will I also be able to learn more about the different races and their roles? Every time I think I have a grasp on your world, someone throws something out of left field, like the Hall of Souls, and I'm totally lost again. Oh, definitely. You'll know as much as we do. Maybe more, since you'll have a degree in it. Gala was practically skipping down the sidewalk now. Okay, I sighed. I think you're right. I've got to learn as much as possible, especially if I want any hope of finding my mom. If it's not too late, I think I'm going to switch my enrollment from NYU to Columbia. Gayla squealed, and the girls wrapped me in a three-way hug, spinning around on the sidewalk with zero regards for the pedestrian traffic jam we caused. As soon as they released me, my eyes were drawn to a little white owl that fluttered down out of nowhere to land on the crosswalk sign up ahead. Taped to the pole was a flyer with a cheap black-and-white photo of Clayton Miles printed across the front. I stared at his handsome Agarthian grin, wondering if somehow he was able to glamour through printed photographs as well. But no, I felt just fine. The words across the top were calling for extras in a movie that would soon be shooting in New York, and of course, the movie was going to be filmed on the Columbia campus. I just can't get away from these guys, I said with a sigh. I'm not sure why you want to. Want to trade spots? Gayla laughed and tugged me across the street. Just kidding. Let's get you an iced coffee now so we can get your schedule figured out. With a major in locating lost mothers and a minor in kicking a Garthian butt, I'm sure you're going to have plenty of class options to choose from. Later that night, the streets were slick with light drizzle falling from the New York City sky. Lights reflecting from the wet pavement glittered in the darkness, undisturbed by pedestrians. The only people still out in the city were due to begin stumbling out of the bars at any moment, just in time to crawl into their beds before the warm glow of dawn could reach them. A girl with fiery red curls giggled about twenty paces ahead, her short pink dress did little to hide the dark liquid staining the front of it. Tate could smell the fruity, alcoholic scent of the stain even from as far back as he stood. Stupid mortals, so careless with their actions. He moved ahead, noting the burly young man who prowled out of a nearby bar toward the girl. She giggled again, seemingly unafraid, but something about the man didn't sit well with Tate. His movement was too deliberate, his expression determined, his sobriety unusual for a man chasing after a girl as inebriated as a redhead he followed. 
she giggled again, stumbling over her own feet, and landed against the wall, propping her sluggish body up against it for support. The man glued himself to her without a moment's hesitation, only he wasn't helping her back to her friends or hailing a cab. Instead, he leaned in close, whispering something into the girl's ear. Tate watched as her drunken grin faded to confusion, then slowly morphed into a scowl. She blinked, and it looked like a struggle for her to open her eyes again. Hey! Tate shouted. The man looked over his shoulder. Can I help you with something? His voice came out like a growl through his forced smile. Yeah, actually. You can get away from the girl. Tate picked up his pace, jogging over to what he knew was an already bad situation before it got any worse. She's fine. She's just had a little too much to drink. I'm going to take her home and get her nice and taken care of. A streetlight glinted off of his menacing eyes. No, you're not. Oh, yeah? What are you going to do about it, chump? The man reared back his hairy fist, but Tate knew it was coming. He'd already drawn power from the well deep within his mind. Stop. The man froze. You will never step foot into another bar again. You will never drug or take advantage of another woman. In fact, you will never even date another woman. Prepare for a life of solitude. Now get out of here before I hit you and give you a life with a crooked nose, too. The man ran down the sidewalk. Maybe Tate took it a little too far with the life of solitude bit, but he was tired of these mortal men feeling all high and mighty. That ought to knock him down a few notches. Two other girls ran out of the bar a moment later. Lacey, oh my goodness, are you okay? We've been looking everywhere for you. One of the girl's friends glared at Tate. What did you do to her? I saved her life. Now get her home so she can sleep this off. He left, certain now that the girl was in good hands. Besides, he had more monsters to face tonight. If only this next meeting could go as smoothly. Something scuttled across the road as he finally reached the warehouses at the edge of Hunt's Point. Tate never liked this part of town, but especially not in the middle of the night. He could handle whatever the city might throw at him, of course. He just didn't prefer to. But Rossell insisted this was where they had to meet. He knocked on the door, eager to get off the streets just in case someone in the area recognized him. He didn't want to be seen associating with Olympians. If she found out somehow, the entire plan would be ruined. Come in, Rossell's creaky voice called out. The interior of the warehouse wasn't much brighter than the streets outside. Rossell's hair appeared to glow in the silvery moonlight, filtering in through the dingy windows overhead. You're late. I had something to take care of. Tate wouldn't apologize, not to Rossell. Hmm. Even his grunts sounded condescending. Well, I'll keep this brief. I'm sure we both have other places we'd rather be. I brought you here tonight because it's time to see some action. He's growing impatient. There's not much else I can do. I'm not even convinced there are any powers to reveal. She might truly have a mortal soul. Impossible. How can you be sure? Because I... Rossell choked, grabbing at his throat as he fought for a lungful of air. He couldn't have been more than 700 years old, but he sounded like he was on his deathbed with all that wheezing. She does not have a mortal soul, he whispered at last. I don't care how you force her powers to reveal themselves. I just need you to do it. Seduce her or terrify her. Bring her to the edge of her life. It doesn't matter. Just get the proof you need to extract her soul. I've tried those things. She doesn't seem to be responding to me. I think we just need more time. There is no more time. I was assured you were the right man for the job. But if you can't do it, I'm happy to call. No. Tate clenched his fists. I'll do it.
Good. Find me when it's finished. Tate didn't delay his exit. He leaned against the outside of the warehouse, allowing the cool night air to work against the weight on his chest. He couldn't fail this mission. Too much was on the line. He may not understand the council's infatuation with the girl, but he wouldn't let them down. He would extract Everly's soul, no matter what it took, even if that meant calling on his friends for some help. With a sigh, he pulled out his phone and dialed. The line rang four times before a groggy voice finally answered with a muffled curse. What in the world do you want at this hour? Sorry, man, but I need to call in that favor you owe me. This has been Fractured Soul, Daughter of Sea and Sky, Book One, written by A.R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg, copyright 2023 by A.R. Colbert, production copyright by A.R. Colbert.